talk. Um, we hear stories about our guests and you know their very nerdy upbringings and how they fell in love with computers. Do you have one of those iconic stories of you and a Commodore 64? I mean, I, I so there's a little bit of feedback. Um, yeah, oh, I um, I grew up in the UK. Uh -huh. um, I'm a half English, half French, and um, you know, my first experience with computers was um, were tape based. You remember, right? Uh, like pads. Uh -huh. Remember pad computers and like tape based computers. So it was really early days, and um, uh, and then when I came to the states, um, I came. To uh, when I was 17 to go to university. Uh, and that sort of more immersed me into sort of computers and computer landscape and so on. There wasn't much in England. Um, but I was, I, I think from a very early age, I was, I would say that I'm sort of innately, I'm a tinkerer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I love even today sort of taking things apart and trying to solve problems. And that sort of, you know, that tinkering sort of aspect of, of my character is, you know, is, you know, it's a big piece of what we do at BetterWorks, and mm -hmm. it's sort of, that's been a theme throughout um, my career. Did you, does that sort of extend to like hardware too? Like are you someone who like working on cars? Are you someone who like I mean, I used to, takes when, things apart? Yeah, when I was a kid I would take things apart and I would, I would put, um, I would try to put them back together again and mm -hmm. sometimes I would succeed and sometimes I wouldn't, but I love, Sort of I, uh, hardware, software. I mean, I would love you know anything. Steam, like you know those like kids' steam things. I blew one of those up. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I um I enjoy I enjoy. I mean, I do it with my kids now. I enjoy taking things apart and understanding how they work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, is it less like, satisfying I, doing that I in really, software? I really like. Let me make a, 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 a point here. I really like. Um, I really like being able to get in on, on inside of technology. I mean, I think that uh, one of the things that today uh, I think is 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 very important as we architect, you know, what we're building and how we build things is to still allow people to get inside of technology. What do you mean, get inside of technology? I mean, like, um, so I'm thinking there was there's a wonderful piece I read years ago by Neil Stevenson called "In the Beginning Was the Command Line." Mm -hmm. And he talked, um, he, it's a 15 page essay. It's not like a Stevenson tome. Um, it's, um, it's an essay. And he talks about the fact that the command line, yeah, he talks about the command line and he talks about uh, Windows and uh, the Apple GUI and the interface. Mm -hmm. And he talks about you know, this, um, uh, this veneer that is placed on top of computing by the interface. Mm -hmm and how that manages the interactions and you know, people slowly become, the command line becomes more and more abstracted. Mm -hmm. And so you know, ultimately you don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Or you, know, you can fire up terminal, but it's, like, it's way down there in the stack. Mm -hmm. And I think that with technology period, I mean, I'm, um, I was talking about this with some people a couple of weeks ago about sort of how algorithms are becoming a similar layer. You know, so I like to be able to pierce through. And uh -huh. I think it's very important that we can um, because I think, it's, um, I think it's important that we understand um, the technology that we're building and that we have access to the sort of the, the cogs and the wheels inside of it. That's interesting because a lot of people feel like platforms like you know Apple's or Facebook's and just you know the lamp stack that's been created has sort of freed people up from the real technology yeah. and has allowed people to be designers and creatives but not yeah. coders and still build companies so do you think that's been a bad trend I wouldn't say bad I mean I think that um, you know good and bad are just you know they're very they're sort of they're very binary easy and sort of um, concepts which I think here in the West we, we um, and particularly the media love because mm -hmm. it you know sets up it polarizes points of views and then you can use that for everything from debate to link, link bait um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I wouldn't say good or bad I mean look if you if you think about New York Tech mm -hmm. if you think about what we do at Betaworks I mean we've been uh, both huge um, uh, we've We've invested hugely in the 
um, in the design and the interface layer of you know, what this new world that we're collectively building is becoming. Um, so I think it's, um, uh, I, I, there's a lot of good things about it, but there are some bad things about it. And I think that being able to pierce through it is really important. You know, one of the things I love about Twitter still is that you, know, you could get to the rawness of the street, right? An issue I've always had with Facebook, ever since I, you know, when it first, you know, the day after it came out of the college market into the broad market, I signed up for it. I was like, the, um, the, the algorithm applied to the feed, to me, was just like something I didn't want. Right? I just wanted the rawness of the feed. And then I wanted to be able to filter that myself. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, I think that that kind of access is important. Interesting. Do you think that that's, I mean, that seems a more Silicon Valley point of view. I think there's always an obsession with openness of information, being able to take your information with you, being able to get down to things. Um, do you think that's a more Valley point of view in New York? Do you think people, people have that sort of getting inside the technology obsession? Yeah, I don't consider that a Valley point of view. I mean, you know, Apple was famously anti that. Um, and so I think that it's, um, uh, it's definitely a, a point of view that some people propagate in the valley and, and mm -hmm. you know, believe in the valley, but I think you see both. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a um, New York versus valley thing. Mm -hmm. We can do some of those if you want. <laughs> there, are, there are some of those, but I don't well, think it's that. Um, well, I do want to talk about um, the sort of early Silicon Alley days in New York, because I know yeah. you were, that's you know, so when you got your start, and you were building different sites and selling things and running around. And you know, a lot of people have talked about how what's going on in New York now you know, really is an outgrowth of sort of those seeds of that era, even the things that didn't work out so well, even, the, even though immediately after it, people might have thought, oh, that was all sort of a failure. So how did you wind up in the original Silicon Alley scene? When did you get involved in it? And so I was, um, uh, I, I was there, uh, or I started off in 94. Okay. Um, and um, the journey for me was really, um, uh, it, it's, it really started with a drink. Um, As many good things do in life. Yeah. Um, and so I, um, in 91, I was uh, working here in the city and I was working uh, for a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of data intensive stuff and we did a lot of uh, analytical stuff. Um, and a um, uh, great group of people that I was working with there. And we got, um, we got asked by Reuters, the news organization, um, by their board to sort of plot out what the, the world of information delivery would look like uh, by the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. right? So this is 1991 and they were trying to look 10 years hence. Mm -hmm. You know, what will information delivery look like and how will it, um, how will how will their world look? And remember Reuters, I mean, most people think of it as a news organization. It's really, most of it is a financial um, information delivery platform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, stock bonds, prices, all that stuff. So anyway, so I did, um, I did what consultants do is that I, you know, they, they paid us a fair amount of money for us to go and talk to all the experts and form an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the experts were actually their country regional managers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually tagged with going to Asia and to Europe and to interview each of the regional managers for Reuters um, about um, what the future would look like. And so I met with, um, I had a bunch of interesting meetings, but I met with the guy who ran Reuters in France. Mm -hmm. And we had a long chat in his office. And, um, and then he said, young man, let's just go and have lunch. We should continue this over lunch. And so uh, he was very French and he ordered wine. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of lunch is that he like, looked at the wine in, in his glass and he said, you know, I want to be able to sell that on the network. And uh, I want to be able to sell wine on the network. Mm -hmm. And so we talked for about another hour about that. Um, and uh, we talked about how you could use private networks. You know, there was the beginning of um, sort of small networks uh, that were being used commercially, mostly for financial services. Mm -hmm. And Reuters had one like that, right? And mm -hmm. so a couple of 
probably a couple of thousand people on either on, on the network. Mm -hmm. uh, so small, but it was. But uh, I was fascinated by that. So then, fast forward. Um, I went to uh, I went to business school. Mm -hmm. Went to Wharton um, in '92, and um, which was kind of a waste of time. But was it? it was, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I, I mean, the best thing happened at Wharton was I met my wife, and so you know, Blair was. Um, the, the best thing that came out of the MBA education for me. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, when I was, I spent a lot of time, and uh, one of the things which was great about Penn and Wharton actually was that they, were, they had a very good computer science school, right? And um, so I did a bunch of courses in other areas of the school. You can cross over into Penn, and I, um, I did a bunch, I did computer science courses, I did um, a Sanskrit course, I did a bunch of different things, I had fun. Um, but it was, as an education, it was not, the MBA itself was not worth um, uh, either the time or the money. Um, but when I was there, I started tinkering with a lot of the early online networks, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're starting to see these private networks, if people remember them, you know, CompuServe, AOL, and sort of these non-web-based networks that were, you know, doing email and other things. and. So I started playing around with them. And then in my, um, in my second year at Wharton, I had a friend of mine who was working at the AI lab up at MIT. Mm -hmm. And he called me up and he said, um, we have a terminal here where we have the World Wide Web running on terminal. Mm -hmm. And so this is, um, we're talking about 93, late 93. Um, and uh, the browser was, this was pre-Netscape, right? So Netscape hadn't been formed yet. And so, was it called Spy something? I've forgotten, it was, you know. Anyway, I, I drove up to Boston mm -hmm. from Philadelphia to go see the web, right? So I drove like four hours <laughs> um, because I was fascinated by this. And um, this friend of mine, Mark Bonchek, um, uh, showed me in, in, the, uh, in the AI lab, they had one computer, it was a Unix computer, and they had a web browser on it. Mm -hmm. And um, he pulled up, uh, we pulled up a couple of web pages, and there was, a, uh, there was a French guy who had a website which was called Le Louvre um, Web or something, mm -hmm. where he'd taken sort of 10 pictures of the Louvre mu Museum in Paris and stuck them up on the web. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I remember sitting there, you know, and the images would take yeah, about 10 minutes to render, so line by line you'd see the images coming in. And uh, I, got, I got in my car and I drove back to Philadelphia and I, you know, I said to the woman who became my wife, I said, you know, I've seen the future. This is, this is what is going to change the world of media and information delivery. Um, and then I was like, I, I was fraught with panic mm -hmm. because um, I couldn't graduate fast enough and I was convinced that it would be like, it would grow up and get commercialized within six months. <laughs> <laughs> Why so, did you feel like that was, I mean, because to people who come up and experience the web now, that yeah. sounds like a pretty shitty web experience. Why was seeing a picture line, ro roll in line by line, why was it so transformative? Oh, well, because it was, you know, the, the very, very simple, you know, the idea that somebody has, uh, you know, it's the, the, the base client architecture, the distributed client architecture of the web, right, mm -hmm. that some guy, Nicholas Pinochet, no, I forgot what his name was. That it was Nicholas something. It's uh, he, um, you know, that he had a computer in Paris, um, you know, underneath his desk, and that I was sitting there in Boston, um, looking at a page which he had authored, mm -hmm. right? So it's the distributed architecture of the web and the ease of authoring, mm -hmm. right? And it was we're talking blinking text. We're talking very early. I mean, I went also to the. Um, about a month later, I went to the second, the first or the second World Wide Web conference, which was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and because, uh, you know, the, at, and at that conference, Netscape, it was announced just afterwards, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but at the conference was fascinating because 80% of the people at the conference were academics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, 80 or 90, there were very few people who weren't academics. And, and when I say academics, it's like really research people who wanted to, you know, were building on the internet as a research tool. Mm -hmm. But you so. thought this will be 
a mass consumer thing. When you first saw it and thought, I've got to get out of school quickly, did you think about what applications would be developed for it? Did it, did what, it, how much did it bear in reality to how we use the web today? Well, I think I was massively wrong in terms of like the time scale that I thought it would get, it would develop. Um, I had this, um, I had this very firm belief that um, uh, we needed to, that this medium was different and the things that would be built on this medium needed to be fundamentally different. Um, you know, maybe today we call that native um, or sort of endemic to the medium. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we'd figure out the medium much quicker than we did. And so I think that I was kind of amazed, you know, 10 years later, say, just to take a point in time, um, I was kind of amazed at how quickly we were to impose upon the medium um, our sort of templates from other media forms, uh -huh. right? So the browser came along, right? And um, you know, they made a very fundamental architecture decision with the browser that, you know, if you go back to Tim Berners-Lee's spec, right, read and write word equal weighty, right? But the browser, the very metaphor of a browser calling the thing a browser was fundamentally a view browsing tool. Mm -hmm. And so the right aspect of the web, you know, suddenly when Netscape came out, it was like 80, 90% read and 10% write. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I think that for the first decade after that, it was that. And then gradually we've seen that sort of, you know, balance out. I think we still, there's still a bias. And, and the metaphors all came from, of the web, came from print uh -huh. pages. Um, they came from sort of our understanding of cartology and maps, mm -hmm. navigation, browser, you know, back button, forward button, direction, you know, and architecture, mm -hmm. sites, mm -hmm. phys physicality. We were trying to like, we were trying to anchor this sort of, you know, this totally, uh, you know, boundless thing in some metaphors that we understood. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed, I mean, we're still trying to do that, right? And, um, and so we're still boxing it. We're still boxing it in a lot of times by our understanding that we bring to it from other media and from other things. Do you try to peel that away at Betaworks? Yeah, Can yeah. Can you give us some examples? Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the things that, um, that is different that we do at Betaworks is, you know, we are trying, we're building a collection of things, right? And so uh, the, the belief is, is that uh, when we started Betaworks up about five and a half years ago, is there were a couple of ideas that sort of we put on the table and we said, you know, these things we hold true, or these mm -hmm. are the things that we're gonna believe that we're gonna, and so one of them was that there was a another big shift coming, right? Because I think that the web sort of got in a period of stasis for about eight, seven, eight years, you know, and Google was like benign dictator over the, over the web. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, they were a nice dictator. Um, you know, I think of all the dictators we could have chosen, um, I'm glad we didn't choose AOL um, <laughs> as an industry. I think that, uh, I think that Todd's laughing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and next AOL. Uh, um, uh, so they were a benign dictator, but they were still a dictator, right? And they, uh, you know, traffic flows, just, you know, Google dominated. And so one thing we concluded was the world was changing, and it was going to get upended again um, by several transformations. One was social, another one was the move to devices, and you know, move to touch-based interfaces, phones, watches, all this stuff. It was all gonna get opened up again and redefined. So that was one thing. The second thing is, is that, um, you know, the system that we have for innovation, um, I'm facet, I've, I thought a lot about it. And so, you know, so, I mean, my career, I, I went from, you know, that, you know, couple of hours at the AI lab, fast forward to leaving Wharton, starting my first company. I could talk about that later, but selling that to AOL, mm -hmm. staying at AOL for a couple of years, doing a bunch of things at AOL, then moving to Time Warner um, after the AOL um, acquisition, um, taking um, 
taking the job of the CTO at Time Warner um, and uh, running a team there at Time Warner, looking across all tech at Time Warner, and then leaving Time Warner and starting again um, as an entrepreneur. <coughs> and when I came out um, and started again as an entrepreneur, I believed firmly that this, this innovation model that we had um, didn't seem to scale very well. It's like I was fascinated by the fact that you have these incredible companies that are born, right? So let's talk about some people today or some people from yesteryear. Look, I mean, AOL, Yahoo was a phenomenally in innovative company once upon a time. Mm -hmm. And um, Marissa Mayer may be revitalizing that today, um, but you know, Yahoo has not innovated much in the last five years, right? right? Um, I think that you know, eBay was a phenomenally innovative company and then it stopped. Right? Um, I see signs that Facebook is you know, sort of reaching that, that edge where they're not innovating the way they were. Um, so, so why is it that these incredible companies get born, fantastic innovation, and then they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they can't innovate anymore, and they end up innovating just by making random acquisitions, right? right? Which they then can't necessarily fit into the puzzle or make sense. And, you know, one of the things I think about is that if you, um, if, you take, if, you, if you take the web, right, and if you could pick up the web, right, and look at it from underneath, right, what you'd see is you just see these clusters of data, right, and data just moving around in servers and just like clusters of data, right, and, um, um, and the clusterings would be around these things that we call corporations, mm -hmm. right? There'll be some nonprofits in there, and there's Wikipedia, and there's you know other things, but a lot of them are corporations. <laughs> and the corporate structure is something that we impose upon. You know, the web doesn't, the technology isn't bounded by that, right? We've imposed these boxes on top of these data sets and said that's a corporation, and this is the wall of the corporation, and there'll be some rules by which data or business you know, which will interact beyond that to another corporation. And those may be APIs for data and they may be you know, legal agreements for partnerships and so on. But we've then imposed this structure. And yet, if you look how people, users, mm -hmm. uh, engineers, how people build, um, they're, I wouldn't say they're blind to those things, but they're not constricted by them, mm -hmm. right? They want their data, users want their data to be available, right. portable. And I believed firmly that this new era, when we started five years ago, would be characterized as a, there would be several big companies, a handful of big companies. So it wouldn't be the monolithic era of Google. Mm -hmm. um, there would be a bunch of big companies. And I think that's played out, right? You can see, right. I mean, Facebook's clearly a huge company, but Twitter's a huge company and very successful. And LinkedIn's a big company and they're a player and so, you know, and then maybe you can argue about Snapchat or Foursquare or Path or, you know, or Tumblr. But, you know, it's a, we're not living in a monoculture. And so, because we're living in this world of diversity and diversity of platforms, right? It's not Windows and Google. It's not just a single platform world. Um, data has to move between those things and, and, and data wants to move um, because as it moves, it actually gains context um, and it gains value. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so, so going all the way back, you told me this thing is like an hour and a half, so I'm giving you the whole version of this, okay? Yeah. So, um, but going back to your question is that we said, um, uh, we said, A, can we create a company, Betaworks, where we can actually sustain and continue to innovate? Uh-huh. Right, so that's a big idea. That's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something we're trying to do, mm -hmm. right? And I think thus far, we've got, we've got some really good seeds of that. Um, mm -hmm. So number one is can we create that? Can we create a company that actually promotes the connections between these things, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, going back a bit is we create something like Bitly and then Bitly is integrated in something like TweetDeck, which we've invested in, and it's integrated into a bunch of other things. And, mm -hmm. you know, and we sort of we promote those connections, particularly at the data level. And the, from Betaworks' standpoint is that the more the data moves, the more those services are used, the better, mm -hmm. right? Because we have stakes in all these companies. And so we look at Betaworks as a, 
as an ecosystem and not as a monoculture or not as a single point thing, right? right? And we're trying to grow it like that. And so the idea is, is that can we create a company that is a big company that is a um, uh, that can sustain innovation mm -hmm. and can look at like 20 years of innovation and can grow through that mm -hmm. and and um, and also um, one where there's a lot of pieces and the pieces some of them are tightly connected or coupled and then some of them are more loosely coupled. Right. So does this mean you don't want anything that you guys create at BetaWorks to become such a breakout hit that it overshadows all the others? Oh no. Um, um, that I mean that would be I mean, stupid, because, right? Well, but, but that is I mean part of but the, the architecture what you're describing. the, the if you're architecture talking about is, something like Google it is dominated by paid search because that is such a good business. Yeah, I mean, Google's yeah. tried many, many attempts to spend yeah, billions yeah, yeah. in acquisitions to try to diversify yeah, from that, yeah. and, it, and it doesn't work. I mean, this is sometimes an accidental thing. Where yeah, no, look, I mean, to say, yeah, yeah. Ev Williams and the obvious version one, right? Right. And so, um, try a bunch of stuff, and Twitter was one of the things, and bang, right? Right. So, um, uh, I think that the, um, the, you know, everything we do um, is, you know, we're, we're, we love big, right? Uh, we love scaling things, right? Bitly grew, Bitly grew to a huge scale very fast. We love that. Mm -hmm. um, we're fairly obsessed with habit and habit forming things, mm -hmm. right? And the, the word in our business for that is engagement, right? We, are, we love habit forming things, right? So um, one of the filters that we use for the things that we create at Betaworks is, is that something you'd want to use every day? Mm -hmm. Is that something you want to, you know? And so when I see a tweet out there where somebody says, you know, I wake up in the morning to Poncho's um, weather report, um, I use check in to dig, I shorten my links with Bitly, and I, um, and when I want some downtime, I play dots. Mm -hmm. um, I love that, right? And so we want you know, multiple touch points. And we want to see the engagement around those things. Um, we love big things, um, but the architecture of Betaworks is we're trying to create this platform where we can grow multiple things. And so, I mean, the, the question is one we've batted around you know, and talked about what if. I mean, I, look, this platform, there is massive network effects and mm -hmm. scale that can occur on this platform. And so um, if, you know, if we planted a seed that grew like that, like Google, mm -hmm. um, it would probably, um, you know, just to use sort of the, so I feel like we're using ecological metaphors, but it would just sort of like tree-wise, it would just like, the roots of that would upend a lot of other stuff. Right. I hope it wouldn't upend everything mm -hmm. because um, we're really trying to build a, a a company and a platform that we can sustain and, and, and grow innovation. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's such an obsession in a lot of the venture world with, okay, that's interesting, but can that be a billion dollar company? Yeah. Um, and it keeps a lot of things that would be really cool that a lot of people would love and maybe use every day from getting developed. Right. I mean, one of the things as an outsider, one of the ways that I think about Betaworks is that you you go ahead and develop a lot of things that a VC might say, well, that's a feature, not a business, or right. that's not a billion dollar company. Do you think of, what is the filter by which you think about things? Does it have to be big or does it just have to be interesting? Um, it has to be habit forming um, and it's part of what people's everyday life is. It has to be interesting. It has to fit into sort of the design ethos that we're trying to build at Betaworks. It has to be something people can love, right? I mean, it's. If you look at tapestry, you know one of the um, uh, one of the, I was going to say products, tools, businesses we've created. Mm -hmm. You know the 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 words that people use around tapestry, the engagement, the emotional engagement people have around it is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and that reflects in the sort of completion rate of um, of of, of um, when people are tapping through or reading stories, mm -hmm. um, which is way up there in terms of, um, uh, it's like 85%, which is phenomenal. Um, and so um, they, uh, they have to be things that we love. 
Um, I mean, we are um, we're picky, and uh, and they and also the people. I mean, people are like such an incredibly important piece of they're the they're the 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 it's the individuals you interact with day in and day out is to be the kind of people. But you know, to your question of you know billion dollar, um, you know we. Um, that's not the primary filter that I impose upon things, that we impose upon things. Mm -hmm. And um, why? Because um, I think that's a stupid filter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a stupid filter because is asking can that change the world or can that change the way people read in the case of tapestry or discover in the case of dig or play in the case of dots. You know, can it change the world? Can it change people's lives? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. But a billion dollars is like, you know, you couldn't, I, I don't think you could have um, said to me you could roll the clock back and talk to Sergey and Larry and say, would this be a billion dollars? They were trying to navigate the web, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to solve a very hard problem in, in a elegant way. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that billion dollar filter, yeah, I just think that's a ruse. I just think that, is it, can it change the world? Can it change people's lives? That's a good filter. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also think that, you know, to the VC question, I think that one of the things that we have today um, is that, you know, we have this, I mean, the VC model is an incredible model, right? And it's a very, very fine-tuned, well-tuned, like, screwdriver. But I think we're in a world where there should be other tools, right? And, you know, some things require a Kickstarter, some things require a beta website model, some things require an accelerator or tech school like Techstars, like Y Combinator kind of model. Mm -hmm. And so some things are just people want to bootstrap and put them in the app store and, as a paid app. And right. take. So I think we've got this massive increase at the bottom of the, at the bottom of innovation. And the VC model is just an incredible model. It was, it was, it was created initially to solve a different problem. Right? Mm -hmm. It was created to solve problem related to hardware innovation. Right. And then that worked very well for internet infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty darn well for internet, big internet, sort of at a certain layer in the stack. I think that one of the things that doesn't do a good job is that, and this goes to the crash actually, is that it tends to build a lot of really tall trees, or tries to build just tall trees, right? And mm -hmm. so I use the analogy sometimes of, you know, that the internet and what we have today is like, kind of like the rainforest. Um, you, you walk into the rainforest and you think it's this incredible ecological event, mm -hmm. incredible forest. Um, but rainforests are actually very fragile. Uh -huh. They have really, really fertile undergrowth and then really big trees that make it to the canopy and get sunlight. Mm -hmm. But there's very little in between. Right. And I think that that makes the system kind of unstable. Mm -hmm. And I think that the VC model does some of that. Yeah. And so, you know, having some things in the middle, I think is actually a really good thing. Because it builds, it can build more sustainable businesses and a more sustainable system for innovation. Do you think part of that is the fact that most of the internet is ad-based? And in order to get to the enough revenues you need to become either really, really gargantuan and build enough scale that then you can have sort of display ads running across it like Facebook does. Yeah. Or, you know, you are this sort of tiny publication that just never gets to scale and there's no other way to monetize. I mean, yeah. It seems like the monetization is what drives a lot of that. Yeah. You've got to get a billion users. Yeah, I think and that goes to back to sort of uh, Google's benign dictatorship, right? Because I think that, you know, they had an incredibly effective model of monetization, which you can call advertising. Um, I, it, it's not really advertising, right? It's, you know, it's an auction. Um, uh, it's closer to direct marketing than it is tra tra traditional advertising. But I think that, they, um, that a myth was propagated, and I'm not saying anybody was bad, you know, that Google generated this, because I don't, I don't think anybody intended to, but I think a myth was propagated across the web that advertising, you could support yourself through advertising and use Google tools and so on and so forth, right? Um, I think we should have started much earlier um, with um, uh, other business models, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, you know, I think it was really unfortunate that, I mean, it's great, very happy for Venmo and for Braintree and what they're building, but it was really unfortunate that PayPal was kind of cut off in its prime. You know, 
Um, I always wondered, I remember back in the day, what would have happened if you know, the, browser did, the browsers had integrated payments in there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, because what is iTunes, right? It's a shell, it's a browser. You know, and you periodically get these errors in there because they're server, I mean, they basically, they serve up HTTP in there in a lot of the windows, it's a browser, mm -hmm. but it's got payments integrated into it, right? Uh -huh. And so why could the, the actual browser not do that? And, and I think that could have changed you know, quite a bit of the business model. Interesting. Um, yeah, because even getting someone to pay a penny is so hard Yeah. on the web. Yeah. How do you feel about Bitcoin? A lot of people have said that one of the reasons they're super bullish on it is almost this sense of anonymity and the sense that it's like this general ledger of the web where you know, this thing has this intrinsic value and you don't have to have a credit card number or authentication and in some ways that sort of opens payments up beyond even sort of boundaries. Are you, are you bullish on Bitcoin? Look, I'm fascinated. I mean, cryptocurrency, um, uh, which I'll say generally because um, I think Bitcoin is one of, uh, there will be several flavors of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, let's talk about cash for a second. Cash is a, you know, Cash was a phenomenal inve invention, right? And um, you know, it goes back a couple of thousand years, right? I mean, there's like cash has been used. But even a hundred years ago, right, here in New York, right, you were the issuing banks, you know, would, you know, cash came from like Citibank or the Citibank of New York. I remember, I mean, a long time ago, I, I remember researching this. And um, so I think cash has, took a long time to evolve. But you know, the fact that I can give you $5 and uh, the fact you can give it to him and mm -hmm. that we all agree it's $5 and that we all agree that, um, uh, that he now owns it, mm -hmm. um, but there's no trace of where it came from is, you know, is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So I think cryptocurrency um, like Bitcoin and other things are gonna be um, a big piece of, the, of, of what we're gonna build and the ecosystem. I think it's a, it's a, it's a big invention. Mm -hmm. And it's going to change a lot, and it has a lot of the characteristics that I've seen before. Sort of, it has the wild, sort of the wild woolly sort of ness uh -huh. of the beginning of the web. You know that we've wrung some of that wildness out of the web, right? Um, and um, and I think it has some of that, right? It's um, uh, which is fascinating. Um, uh, and yeah, so I'm fascinated by. It. Uh huh. Um, and we have, you know. Nick over at Betaworks has been playing around with, um, I'll tell you a story, it's, um, it's fun. Um, so we had a, a friend at a large VC who, um, uh, who called us about a, one of the Bitcoin companies and said, you know, we're gonna make an investment and um, we'd love to see if you guys wanna join us. Um, we think you'd be fascinated by the company. And, yeah. uh, and so, uh, we had, um, so we, we took a look at it and we were, um, and we thought it was fascinating. And Nick, uh, Nick Charles, uh, who runs investments at Betaworks, um, is um, you know, by training, he's, he's a math guy and he sort of jumped into it and he came in one Monday morning, he said I spent the whole weekend, he said I had to go to CVS to like get a money order, but you know, he walked through the whole process, but he was like, this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so then what happened was, this was a couple of months back, and there was like a feeding frenzy into, um, into the sector that was beginning to warm up, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started, you know, it was clear that our allocation was going to get smaller and smaller in this investment. Right. And one of the things Nick said is, he said, you know, what's really interesting about this company is, is that what, the company has an alternative cryptocurrency, and they are holding 20 million units in the company. Mm -hmm. And yet all the software is, all the technology is open source. So the real value of the company is the currency. Mm -hmm. And so Nick and I sort of looked at each other and looked at Josh and we said, why don't we just buy currency? Mm -hmm. Instead of investing, mm -hmm. just buy the currency. So Nick started buying. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, we didn't buy a lot. Um, but um, it's, um, it's now worth about 6x what it was. Wow. So I think um, Nick managed to get like 10 grand. So we started, and, and interestingly, I think um, you know, Nick said we, we appeared in like 
we're like top 50 holder of, of currency mm. for this. And it's one of, it's one of the big ones. Um, and so it's still a very raw, wild market out there. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, I'm fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. it's, not some, it's, it, it's not something we'll do a lot of at Betaworks in terms of the actual, um, we're, we're gonna be more interested in the um, consumer facing, in, the consumer facing windows into the currencies, uh -huh. and then how we can use the currencies to like let people, you know, tip on dig, um, the way the sign do on Reddit, or pay for you know a tapestry that, that uh, is not entirely open or something, you know. Yeah. So that kind of stuff and payments, right? Small yeah. anonymous micropayments. I mean, it's. It, there's a lot of people, particularly in my profession, who believe like the, the horse has already left the barn on models in the internet. People are used to paying, used to paying nothing, used to getting everything for free. And if you try to, you know, say in the media, put up a paywall or you know introduce micropayments, other people will just you know do stuff for free. Do you? I mean, we talked about how it's disappointing that it developed that way, but do you think it's too late no. for it to develop differently? No, I I think that. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, look at the app world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The app world is an incredible ecosystem, um, and people are paying there. So I think that, you know, going to your website, and particularly a website that is a recycled version of your, like, existing media property, mm -hmm. um, and saying that people are going to pay for that, stupid idea. Right? It's just that ain't gonna happen. But thinking about you know, what you do on that device, on, you know, on the iPhone, on, on your Android phone, on, on an iPad, and making that and making an app which is a native experience for that device, and that you know, happens to be um, either having app purchases or something, sure, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it is um, the, um, you know, the pony or the horse has left the barn on, on the in the web browser in that frame, but the web is now so much bigger than that, mm -hmm. right? And so, and it's only getting bigger, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, as we start to move beyond the phone and beyond the, um, the iPad and, you know, so, so I think there's gonna be more opportunities to architect that and I think that Apple, um, you know, have, with the App Store, uh, have done a phenomenal job of that. But even with the App Store, I mean, you saw in the first year or so of it, most people were charging for apps. And there was this sort of understanding of, you know, you're going to pay $1.99 and Apple already has your information. So there's not this sort of these friction points that there were on the web. And it was almost sort of like this web do-over. And then, you know, pretty rapidly people started giving away apps for free. And then it became, no apps have to be free. So is it is it in-app purchases? That's where it's going to go? Or do you think you can build a big consumer company charging for an app? I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, there's, there's great examples of huge consumer companies, particularly in the gaming sector, mm -hmm. um, that are either paid or in-app purchases. Mm -hmm. um, and so it depends on the kind of app. Um, I, I think you've got to, you know, again, taking your, like, you know, I don't know, let's pick on a magazine. You know, taking your magazine and just throwing that into an app and expecting that people are going to pay for that, that's not a good idea. If you could turn it into something that actually becomes valuable mm -hmm. in that medium, on that platform, um, you know, the in-app purchase uh, you know, is a wonderful um, sort of freemium um, alternative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it took Apple a long time to get there, right? I mean, it's like the in-app purchase stuff and the subscription stuff you know, with newsstands, they're still like futzing around with. Mm -hmm. And so I still think it's got a long way to go. Um, uh, I think the newsstand is hugely constraining. So there's a lot to be fixed there. But I think you can, I mean, you know, there are big businesses that have been built there. Right. So um, going back to your rainforest analogy, do you think that we can get more to a place where there are sort of those trees somewhere in the middle where you build you know, a big company that can get, everyone can make a lot of money from, can employ a lot of people, can be sustainable and not just take over fodder, that, you know, has, 
you know, 10, 20 million people who rapidly love that, but never going to get to 100 million, never going to get to a billion. I mean, I think that the, um, uh, it's interesting the way you're framing this, because you're trying, I mean, I, um, I mean, I think what we're, what we're trying to do at Betaworks is, um, is fill out that, is have things across the whole spectrum, mm -hmm. right? So I love having some things which are in that middle that you, you're very concentrated on right now. Mm -hmm. um, having some really tall things too, but having things across that whole spectrum, I think that that's the, so it's not just building out the middle, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it, it, and it's not just doing the monoculture thing, it's, it's really trying to build out the spectrum mm -hmm. and a collection of things. And so, you know, I mean, I'm, it's, I, it, was a pr it was a privilege to, you know, to be an investor in Tumblr, um, which I think is a good example of something that went all the way up, right? Mm -hmm. Great New York company. Um, you know, we were, um, I met David in April of 2007 and, you know, talked to him, uh, this was pre-Betaworks, right? We were just beginning to sort of cook up the Betaworks concept. Um, and um, uh, committed to an investment round when I met him in April. And then slowly, you know, in the fall, it started to come together. Spark led it, USV jumped in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that was our first investment at Betaworks. And, we, uh, and that was certainly something which went to you know, the canopy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's, having that, it's having the diversity. Mm -hmm. That sounds like you're describing a portfolio approach. And I've read that like you don't think of this as a portfolio approach. I mean, I think about it as a I think about it as a connected system, right? And I think about it as a system where the um, the you know, we have um, we have a lot of we have a lot of infrastructure at Betaworks. Infrastructure sounds really heavy and like a lot of people. We have a lot of we have a lot of data at Betaworks. We have a uh, core team beta works. We have a, we have the ability to be able to take something, uh, and test and trial it, uh, very fast, cheaply, and then if it's working, begin to grow it up, mm -hmm. also fairly fast and cheaply, mm -hmm. right? And if you're thinking about a world, right? Think about the world which we live in and where we're moving with crowdfunding and everything, right? You've got, you know, capital is freely available, uh, and widely available. Um, it's so you got drop in the cost of capital, you've got a drop in the cost of development, it's very cheap and easy to develop. And so, you know, what we're gonna see and started to see in the last few years is just an incredible crop of things, you know, coming out and, and of innovation happening, you know, to go back to the rainforest at the, at the ground level, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that the, um, uh, from a, uh, I think about what we're doing at Betaworks is creating a way to be able to, with this sort of studio approach, to be able to give a platform where we can grow things faster, better, cheaper, mm -hmm. and give them an, an advantage which they wouldn't have if they were outside in the rainforest right. on their own. And so it's, you know, it's funny, it's, it is, I mean, what we do is different, and it, um, but it's been done before in other sectors. Huh. Right, and so um, a couple of couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Bob Weinstein uh, from Miramax and um, you know, Weinstein Company, right, uh, came by to see us, um, and he's a fascinating guy. And so, first of all, is he knows nothing about the web, right? Like nothing, right? <laughs> I mean, and he's an amazing film guy. But he's like one of these people who's just complete domain expertise, which I love. I mean, he asked me at one point, he said, so let me understand this. If you want to put up a website, you don't have to pay anybody to put up that website, right? In other words, there's no gatekeeper, right? Right? Because his business is all about distribution and gatekeepers. And he was like, wow. And this was 2013. I'm like, wow, I haven't had one of those conversations in a while. <laughs> um, so, but he's a phenomenally smart guy in his domain. Now, he understood Betaworks in five minutes. Mm. Because he's like, you're doing the same thing that we did at Miramax. That's and he's like, you have, you have platform, you make your own, you know, we made movies, you make websites, they all have a similar genre, you invest in other people's 
uh, web stuff. It is a similar genre. We invest in other people's movies. You do it all under one roof. That's what Harvey and Bob I built. And he said to me, as he said, you know, a lot of people have told me they're building Miramax. He said, you're doing exactly that. And so I think that there are analogs, um, uh, you know, Liberty Media is certainly an analog um, uh -huh. in the cable business. Uh -huh. You know, when I started out, when we started out five and a half years ago, I looked at, there's some really good analogs in the, um, in biotech, um, but I forgot their names. It was like a long time ago, but I remember spending like a day researching them. The biotech guys, if I remember right, what they did was that they usually had patents um, at the holding companies and they would then license the patents down right. to the subs. Mm -hmm. And so, there were, you know, I mean, it was one of the core questions you want to ask is sort of what are, the, what are the assets that you have at the holding company that give the underlying companies a better position in the market, right? right. Give, them a, give them an unfair advantage, get them to scale faster, better, cheaper, right? And so in the biotech model, it was, there was a patent licensing arrangement. Mm -hmm. which I think also clinical trials. I mean, there's a lot of younger companies totally. who sell the licenses yeah. up so yeah. that they don't have to consume the cost yeah. of doing that. Yeah. So what are they in your case? So in our case, I mean, we definitely have, um, I, I would start first and foremost with people, right? I mean, we have a phenomenal team of people um, across Betaworks, the studio, and the network of companies that we've invested in. And, um, you know, people, are, people change everything, right? I mean, I, um, about two years ago, I made some big changes at Betaworks, and we we um, we started to build a team, and really build the team. And it's you know, I'd been for years telling entrepreneurs, you know, people are the most important thing, and you got to build. You know, it's like your bench strength. Thing. It's true. <laughs> um, I did not. I remember. Uh, I I I believed it. But you know how you, you say things, you believe them, but you, you haven't like fully experienced them. Right. And they haven't like f fully like changed the way you think. Mm -hmm. And it, it is so true. I want to talk about the dig acquisition because you, know, you guys are trying to do something that um, no one with the exception of you know, maybe Priceline and eBay have really done well, which has revitalized sort of a, a dying once powerful brand. Um, I think. The question that I always have whenever people come in and try to like revitalize MySpace or people are trying to revitalize Friendster, you see this over and over again, is people will always say, well, there's still a big audience who comes to this site. But how do you know that that's a valuable audience? And is that audience and that brand, um, you know, are, are eyeballs sort of always the same, the same value? Because I know it's interesting. No, okay, no. go ahead. I mean, it is. Um you know, I remember about, you know, before Marissa came in, about a year, a year and a half ago, there was something I saw where there was somebody from Yahoo who was on some discussion like this, and they was, you know, talking about numbers and, um, and some of the Yahoo numbers, and the numbers are astounding, right? I mean, Yahoo has incredible reach, but the interview was like, really? You know, because they just don't see it, right? They don't see it in their everyday workflow. And so, so dig, right? Um, and dig numbers, um, and and how we think about how we thought about dig. So, um, I think that the um, when we acquired dig, uh, they said uh, Google Analytics said it wasn't like the team at dig said anything that wasn't true. Google Analytics said that there was I've forgotten uh, there was ten to twelve million uniques that was coming through there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we did with Dig was we, um, so Dig got, there was a transition here, and I don't know if I got the narrative exactly right, because it, I don't really care that much, it was, it was before us, but there was, mm -hmm. the Washington Post was interested, I think, in buying the whole company, and then they decided just buy the team, and then LinkedIn bought some patents, and then uh, we found the opportunity, and, you know, technically, the, uh, you know, Dig was being run on pretty much life support. Right? Uh -huh. There was a couple of contractors that stayed from the Washington Post who were helping keep it going. And um, it had a big server uh, infrastructure that it was supporting um, and that was costing a, a about 200, 220000 a month. Mm -hmm. um, and they had this bizarre ad deal with AOL where they would make $230,000 a month. Mm -hmm. 
And so we looked at that and we said a couple of things. So we said, first of all, is that um, I, we were building something in the news space called News On Me. And I, uh, we had a really nice start to a product. But I think in the news space, um, it's really hard to break through, right? And I thought Dig was and is a phenomenal brand. And it was a brand that hadn't been, hadn't, hadn't become mud, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I think MySpace turned into like mush, right? I don't think in people's eyes that they knew what it was any longer, uh -huh. right? Because it sort of went from being a music site to nowhere social network, because that was kind of what they needed to do to pretend they were gonna be like Facebook. And they were gonna be, they had this whole expansive view. And people, you know, one of the things that happens with these companies, they become, just incredibly broad in their definition of self, right? Mm -hmm. I think Dig still had a fairly tightly constrained you know, view, social news, right? right? What the internet's talking about right now. So that was one thing. Um, uh, the second thing is, is that we said is, we said we're going to, we need to put it onto a 2012 stack, right? We need to put it onto a stack that we can innovate off and that uh, we can grow off uh, because um, uh, the technology I'm sure was great technology, but some of it probably wasn't. Um, and, um, and some of it was just old, right? And so, um, so what we did was we said to, it was unusual, we said to the dig board, um, we'd, uh, we'd love to acquire it. You know, I said to the team and to Kevin, this, is, you know, this would be a privilege to take this over and run it. Um, but um, we're just gonna take, we're gonna rebuild dig in six weeks. And on August 1st, which is literally when, like, I wish I had a picture of it, but um, the liquidators came in to, like, take the servers away. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so it wasn't going to be pretty what happened if, you know, we didn't turn something else new on. So um, I, I said, on August 1st, we will flip the switch, and there'll be a new dig. Uh -huh. And we'll repoint the domain, and we'll rebuild the whole thing underneath that. And so, so we did it. And, uh, you know, when we, you know, by September 1st and after a month, you know, we looked at our costs and, you know, the hosting cost was about 18 grand. Uh-huh. So it went down from like 200 grand to 18 grand. 220 to 18 grand. Wow. And that is the, you know, that sort of 12x. That's the, that's the industry, right? It's Amazon. It's the whole stack changing. It's the open source stack. It's everything. So we're good at what we do at Betaworks, but there's nothing, you know, it's... It's, um, I expected that, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we thought it would. And, and so now we have a stack we can innovate off, right? We can grow off and we can build from. So that's what, yeah, so that's what happened. Does that answer the question? It does. Why couldn't Dig do that themselves? Because it seemed that they had this ad deal and they were, that was kind of bringing them at stasis. If they could have cut their expenses by 200 grand a month, that would have been a much better situation. You know, um, I, I don't know, um, I, I can't speak for them, but I will say is that, I'll, I'll say two comments, um, and, and I'll say it from, from my experience at AOL, is that you know, when you've got sort of like, let's use junkie analogies, like when you've got you know, uh, that in your veins, it's very hard to pull the needle out, mm -hmm. right? So you've got a revenue stream from an existing advertising relation business that you've built you know, and in AOL's case, a, um, uh, an access business that you've built over years have been core of your business, and yet, how do you pull that needle out? It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, it's, and it's hard to do, it's hard for investors, it's hard for, it's hard for everybody involved. I mean, as I said to the DIG team, you're going back to you, is that you started off with uniques, and all will use as equal, right? Yeah. I said to the dig team, as I said, we're gonna drop this puppy off the roof and we'll see how high it bounces. <laughs> in terms of like, we'll see, like in terms of uniques, you know, where it comes back. Uh -huh. and, um, and those will be real uniques, right? right? Because the audience that is, we're building back at dig now, and you know, the fact that, um, you know, dig is now, you know, it, within the BuzzFeed network, it's a bigger refer than LinkedIn or than uh, Pinterest or than Google Plus, mm -hmm. um, is because it's real traffic. And the reason why I use the refer data is that's people going to dig, finding a story that's interesting, and then clicking through it. Mm 
-hmm. right? And so that's why that's important to me because that is people using the product and clicking through it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, you know, people using it for SEM purposes. It's not people sort of bending and twisting dick for their own purposes. They're going to, you know, the BuzzFeed network is a good sort of, you know, proxy for sort of the content world out there. Right. It's interesting. I think you guys did a survey of Dig readers right when you bought the property to kind of see where the things dig user, were. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dig users. Yeah. And it, I'm going to get sort of the numbers wrong, but I remember yeah. directionally it was one of these things where it was like, "Would you recommend Dig to a friend?" And like, like 80 percent of people said no. I think like, it was, yeah, I think it was more than that. I don't know if Jake's here, yeah, but it was yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I'm being I think it was yeah, 95. conservative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like. What were they doing there every day? Yeah. I mean, there's this amazing inertia yeah. to the web that I don't understand. Yeah. Like, who are the people that go to a site that they hate and wouldn't recommend to a friend every day? Because in the early days of the web, we all thought, oh, well, it's so easy to click in and out of these things. There will be no loyalty in the web. There will be no loyalty in e-commerce the way there is in the physical world. There won't be loyalty in terms of news brands. Like, we'll no longer have the stickiness because you're not locked into things because moving is so easy. And yet. We see a brand like Dig that 95% of people would not recommend to a friend, and they're still going. And they're still going to every day themselves, right? <laughs> like, what's going on with that? I think that they were. I think that they were quietly hoping that one day they would go, and it would have changed, and maybe we made them happy. Um, no, I think that there was. Look, human beings. We, you know, the web has its structure, but we're human, right? And we have habits, mm -hmm. right? We, you know the way we dress, the food we eat, our preferences, the people. We have habits. They're not all logical. They're not all rational. Uh, but that's what makes us human and interesting. And, um, and so I think that, you know, there was still... The, I talked about the Dig brand before, and I, I, I hate using the term brand or th talking about the Dig brand because the word brand sounds like this abstract. People love, loved Dig, right? They loved it. It's like when Marco emailed us about Instapaper, um, it made me happy for a lot of reasons. But one of it is that there aren't any Instapaper users. They are Instapaper lovers. Mm -hmm. They are passionately engaged with that product. They use it many, many times a day. Mm -hmm. You know, take another very different thing which we invested in or bought a large piece of, and we actually moved from Sweden to New York because we loved it so much. It's something called Blog Loving, mm -hmm. which is a fashion blogging network, right? Which is, um, it's different, and it's different from what this audience look at. It's like 90% women, and most of this audience is not women. Um, mm -hmm. It is, um, it's got about 7 million uh, uniques to go through it. Uh, last month, it did about 100 million page views, so it's of a reasonable scale. Um, but people love it, right? And they go, the, the MAUs over DAUs are blog loving. When they first told me them, uh, these were a group of guys in Sweden, I said to the team, I said, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Those numbers are wrong. Because the MAUs over DAUs were about 50%, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort of where Facebook is. It's higher than right. Tumblr, right? And so we said to them, I said to them, I said, do you mind if we put Chartbeat on the site for a couple of months and we'll let you have a free account of Chartbeat? I wanted to see the numbers, right, and see if they put it. Uh -huh. And they did. So people love blog loving. They love Instapaper. They love Dick, mm -hmm. right? It's that, and and it's that love for the, you know, for what, for the promise of what was, right? For the community, for what, you know, for what Dick represented. That is what you know our job is to to build around that because that's the, that's the you know, that's precious. Uh huh. You know, it's interesting, when we interviewed Brian Chesky in January, he talked a lot about love and the importance of love in a site and how if you just had people who loved your site, and you know, it didn't matter how many people, if they really loved it, you could build a business around that. And I remember as he was, he was talking, thinking, well, this is easy for you to say because you've had this, you know, runaway growth, you've not had any trouble since sort of, you know, since the Y Combinator days of having to raise money for this thing and raising money at huge valuations. It's easy for you to say because you have both. You have mass and you have love. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I don't think someone who goes into a venture capitalist and they're like, well, we don't have a lot of scale, but we have a lot of well, love. Yeah. I don't think they're getting funded. Well, they should. I, I, um, I think that's true, but it's, but there are, 
there are venture capitalists who understand that, right? Fred understands that. I think that the, there, are, there, are, uh, there are particularly venture capitalists who've been operators, but people who are builders and, uh, and people who are, first, who are users, mm -hmm. right? And who, that, that, yeah, they, they, they see that. And, um, and so I think it's, there are many of VC who, who, who wouldn't and who don't, mm -hmm. um, but there are some who do, and those are the ones which you should focus on. Mm -hmm. Because they, they understand what you're trying to build and they understand your community. Is there a critical mass of love that you need to be a sustainable business? I mean, because there's probably five people who love MySpace still. Like, there's still love somewhere for everyone. Did you see Rupert Murdoch tweeting about MySpace the other day? I didn't. It was fascinating. I, um, I, I think I retweeted it, but he said something like, it was so weird because he was, you know, I love the fact, he actually writes his tweets, right? Clearly. He clearly writes That's his tweets. not a PR person. And, and it's like for so many years, I mean, they've kept the veneer, yeah, and it's, but it's broken through. It's uh -huh. what I, it's that, that's the command line, right? That's what I love, the rawness right. of that, right? He just like motors through that. Yeah, so he wrote this tweet which said, um, you know, noticed a you know, uh, decline in Facebook's um, engagement numbers. Um, I think you mentioned hours or usage per user was going down. And he said, first sign of danger, I know from that piece of crap, MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> well, that crappy MySpace thing. <laughs> Something crap was in there. Um, and I was like, um, so um, how much love do you need? Um, look, you start off with, me answer the question differently is that I think if you've got something that people love, you can begin to, you got a feature or a product and you can begin to build around that, right? Um, and you can build to turn, begin to turn that into a business, mm -hmm. right? You can then grow that out. As you grow that out, the reason why I advise entrepreneurs to figure out their business models sooner rather than later um, is that I think it's very important to like figure out, to right size your business. It goes back to the size of the trees, right? Uh -huh. And to understand where it is mm -hmm. in the scale, right? Because to understand so that you don't end up distorting your business right. via the business model, right? Business models should ultimately, all too often business models are taxes on a business. or well, they're taxes on the user flow inside the product. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, they should be neutral, or if possible, they should be positive, right? The reason why Google's business model is so astoundingly strong, that one business model, is because it moves with the grain of the workflow, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I remember we did testing, and you know, people indistinguish the right-hand side from the left-hand side of search results, most mm -hmm. people, and the, you know, Google spent billions of dollars perfecting the right-hand side. We always talk about how good search is. He spent a lot of money and invested a lot making the ads really good, mm -hmm. right? So that whatever you searched, you get something of value. So if you can figure out something that moves with the grain of the product, sort of, you know, um, right size it, or like, you know, figure out the correct size for it, and then see if you can get a business model. And the business model thing shouldn't be a, like, I, you know, I, I, I hate when it's, it's a product problem, mm -hmm. right? It's part of the product. Right. It shouldn't be like, oh, we need to bring in those people to figure out the business thing, right? And so it shouldn't be like this external event that happens outside of the flow of the, of the love, right? Mm -hmm. It should be um, you know, the people who built the product who are saying, okay, now we've got another problem. We're going to try and figure out how to build a business around this. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it okay Ideal state, right? I mean, this is, this is right. an ideal state. This is hard to do. Well, I mean, yeah, it is hard to do. And there's certainly a lot of people who say that. I mean, that's what Twitter always said. That's what Evan always said about Twitter. That's what, you know, Facebook said, you know, in, in a particular time. And, like, you can art. I mean, I don't know how great the user experience is with, you know, supportive tweets. But I would think most people think on Facebook the ads are interrupting them. And I'm sure that was not Mark's are, ideal. But and the ads are awful, right? I, do, I don't understand why they're so poorly targeted. I mean, they have incredible data there. 
Yeah, I well, I mean, understand. that was always supposed to be the promise of Facebook, that it yeah. was this great holy grail of knowing everything about people and targeting well. Yeah, I'm fascinated by graph search and you know, how that rolls out. Because you know, some of the initial reviews that, you know, and things that I've heard from that are exposing just how limited the data set. I mean, I think that Facebook did a few things on the data side that I think are, um, maybe it had to do in terms of its business model, but I think that there were some shortcuts that they took that I wonder if they're now paying the price for. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think one was is that they started very early on by uh, trying to impose uh, structured data sets over the friend graph, mm -hmm. right? So you remember like right at the beginning whenever you, you would friend somebody or somebody would friend you, you would uh, get a friend request, you'd be asked to put like in one of five buckets. Right. They were trying to like structure the data and mm -hmm. you know, I, I would sit there as a user and say, I don't know, they're not a work colleague, I wasn't a college with them, what are they, right? I'm just like, get out of my face. It's right. like, I don't want to put somebody into the, one of these buckets. And so they wanted to structure all the data, which I think is a, um, uh, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very convenient way of solving a computer science problem. Mm -hmm. But you're reducing human beings down to a very crude um, set of categories. Uh -huh. And then when you try and, I think that what's amazing about Google's model is that there's a lot of nuance in there, right? Then I think another thing that happened with Facebook is the like system, which again was a very binary. Yeah. Like, do I really like, you know, um, cold and spring water? Well, kind of, but do I really want to, I mean, and then they had advertisers who paid people to like stuff. Mm -hmm. So they kind of like, in the same way that Twitter sort of distorted, there was a lot of you know, if you remember a lot of hoopla about the um, uh, Twitter promoted, the promoted, um, not the promoted tweets, the promoted friends. Mm -hmm. You remember yeah. like right at the beginning, yeah. what yeah. the hell was that called? Um, but in the same way, they distorted the graph, yeah. the light graph, because people were paying in to get, you know, hundreds if not hundreds of thousands of likes, companies were. And so I think that those, um, you know, I'm really interested in seeing how graph search, you know, comes out because I think that um, it's going to expose a lot of the uh, the un the the flavor of the data underneath Facebook. Uh -huh. Interesting. Well, Twitter is a company that you're much closer to. What do you think are the big mistakes Twitter made? Um, you know, I love Twitter, and I think that I mean, I think that t Twitter has done, um, you know, first and foremost, you know, if you want to. I mean, they've done a phenomenal job of just growing up the company. And so, and that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's always easy to talk about mistakes, um, but it's just, it's, that's, that is very hard to do. Um, you know, I was on the other side of the ecosystem debate, uh -huh. meaning that I disagreed. Mm -hmm. um, I still disagree, but I understand the logic of everything they did. And I think going back to your point, I think that, I mean, we were, you know, we had, um, you know, starting with our work with Surmise, and then when Twitter acquired Surmise with the work with Bitly and the work which we did with, you know, TweetDeck and Twitter Feed, we were like, you know, in a lot of spaces in the Twitter ecosystem. Uh -huh. And the reason was is that I thought this, I thought it was genius, right? And uh, and I think that for them it was a bug, uh, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, and the the and and I think that a big piece of that was when they when they made the definitive decision to monetize through advertising, then I was like, okay, now I can see the tide is going to turn. Uh huh. Right, because you could just see that's like one of those domino decisions that, okay, you're going to monetize through advertising. Therefore, you need people looking at your client. Right. Therefore, the client ecosystem has to go away. Uh huh. Will be minimized. Um, uh, because uh, unless you're going to monetize through the client ecosystem and then share like 50 cents on the dollar with the client ecosystem, you know, that's not a rational choice that most companies will make. And so the moment they made that decision, I think that they changed the, uh, the architecture of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Now that said, it's, they've kept it, it's still pretty darn open. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, I think that they, I think that they've sometimes conflicted internally, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wonderful things that they've done, but the, on the ecosystem debate, I just, I love the diversity of it, right? I love the diversity of the interfaces. 
Right. right? You can so, experience it right. so many different ways. You want to use TweetBot, I want to use TweetDeck. Go at it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like it was, you know, it, it was brilliant that, you know, the, the design decision, you know, that's you know, going back to the web as, you know, this big data set is that there's a tight coupling that normally happens between people's data set and between the interface, right? Mm -hmm. And decoupling that into an API and so, you know, people can all use different flavors gives you so many more use cases for the product, right? It makes the product, you know, so much more flexible. Right. Whether it goes into SMS or whether it goes into, it's just like, it turns the product into a weed and it looks more like, uh, it looks a little bit more like email, but the challenges of monetizing that are different. So I think the raising all the money and then deciding on uh, that it was gonna be an ad model, kind of like that sort of cost the, um, the future for me. When did that, when do you see that decision of becoming an ad model taking place? Because some people might say if you start a company and you're not charging, you're effectively opting into the ad model because there's just not a lot else. I mean, did Twitter have another choice? Well, I think that the, it, it goes also to, yeah, I, I agree with most of what you said, but I would also say that I think that the ad model is much richer than a simple, um, you know, survey, um, survey unit of, um, of negative attention, right? It's like going back to Google, it's like that's a more of a direct marketing model, but, it. it's, um, but it's ads that work for people, right? Uh -huh. And so is the, you know, so I think that there's more diversity in the ad model than people normally have, um, or normally imply, and then I think that um, you know, there's more to be done on the paid side. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit, I want to get back to a little bit more of the history of Betaworks because yeah. we sort of got into these bigger issues and yeah, we kind of like, story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, you talked about all these things, this sort of theory that you had in mind when you wanted to start this. Um, and then, you know, but you've always had this mix of how much you're investing out in things, how much you're developing things in house, do you spin things out? How has all of that evolved in time? And, do you back different kinds of projects based on which one of those it's following? Does one give you more freedom than the other? Are there ones where you figured this is just corrosive to the spirit of what we're trying to do? How did the way you go about funding and building and discovering and creating all these things you want to have in this rainforest, the way you were going about doing it change or need to change? How did it need to change? Um, let me try and answer it, and you tell me if I'm answering it. Is that, I mean, I don't think it's changed that much. We've gone through, we've gone through sort of, you know, there was like a first chapter of Betaworks, which I, you know, the first three and a half years, and then sort of a second chapter, which we started about a year and a half ago. And in the second chapter, you know, we had had, um, we had done well, so we could, we had some options to be able to do things that we couldn't do before. But if you go back to the original business plan, many of those things, you know, when we sat around the table, you know, right in the early days with, um, you know, with the, with the core team, with Andy and with Billy and with Neil, um, we, we talked about, you know, th that we wanted to do some of the things that we're now doing, right? We talked, mm -hmm. to, even back then, we talked about Dick. We talked about right at the beginning about UL shortening and tiny UL and, you know, we talked about data and APIs and, you know, what, so, you know, many of the seeds were there, but it's evolved. It is, you know, what we do is on one hand is um, we're very, we're very thoughtful and, uh, but on the other hand, we're very, uh, we, I hope we're react attentive to the environment and we see things and we, we jump from here to here, um, you know, very fast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wouldn't say the, I mean, the dig opportunity um, was absolutely right for us to do. We had no idea it was out there until, you know, Brett Burlington, you know, gave us a shout and said, hey, there's this curious situation we're in, do you want to chat? Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, part of it is strategic and part of it's highly organic, right? Uh -huh. It sounds like with both Dig and Instagram, people kind of reached out to you guys. Instapaper. I'm sorry, Instapaper. Yeah, Instagram I, you do not I, own, yeah, just yeah, to yeah, be I'm absolutely clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. With both of those, they, the A little people, bit more expensive. <laughs> right, yeah. they're slightly more expensive. Uh, they probably could have cut you a deal. You're a nice guy, yeah. you've got a nice a accent. A lot of love there too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with, with both Instapaper and Dig, two of the things that people might know you most for, people reached out to you. Do you think you're known as sort of this home for misfit toys? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, look, when they reached out to us for Dig, that we we had no home for Misfit Toys, right? Right. We had never done that before, and so I mean, I think that the um, Brett was just going down the phone book, and he got to you. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> hey, do you want Dig? I, it's a very short phone book, <laughs> right? Because uh -huh. um, who else are you going to call, right? I mean, it is. Um, it is sincerely, right? It's like there aren't many other sort of development studios of this, in, in, you know, kind that you could like pick up the phone and call, right? And you know, dig. I don't want to speak for them, but I'm certain that they'd speak to, spoken to, all the big guys, right? Mm -hmm. Through their journey. Mm -hmm. And so there, there aren't many other places. Um, and so I think that this, you know, the studio model is. Um, yeah, and certainly with Marco, look, Marco, I mean, you, you wrote me this, you know, this, uh, this email at 2.30 in the morning saying I'm lying here in bed and I'm just trying to figure out what to do with this paper and how to grow it up. And um, I'm making a million dollars a year um, after Apple's cut. And so that's good. Um, I don't want to hire a team. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take funding. And it suddenly hit me is, is the place this should be is at Betaworks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we sat down with Marco, but, you know, I think that he, um, um, first and foremost, I appreciated his trust. But um, I think that he sat there and said, okay, it needs to be an environment where it's going to grow up and, and, and uh, have a team and, uh, and, uh, and grow in the context of, 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 of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marco was always, Inst, Inst, Instapaper was always heavily connected into it. It had a great API, it had a whole bunch of partnerships, right? It had a whole laundry list of services that it worked with. So he already had the same ethos, right? Right. So I think he suddenly said, oh, oh wait, I can see where this fits. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, you know, those, you call them misfit toys or whatever you said, but. <laughs> People love them, and but there are we these, certainly do, yeah. There are these things that are either sort of diminished brands or, you know, the, the derogatory word in the venture business, lifestyle businesses, things that make money and are profitable but can't grow, that, that don't have much of a home. Do you want to be the repository of more of that? Do you, like, go around looking at things and you're like, oh, that's no. a diminished brand, I no. can turn that one around? Yeah, no. Yeah. Hulu? <laughs> um. <laughs> you want Hulu? What would you do with Hulu? Um, I don't know really what I would do with Hulu. I don't, uh, that one I'm a little bit, I, I wouldn't say confused, but I just think the rights issues are where the whole, that whole thing uh, comes unstuck or unraveled. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, we, I mean, we spend, we spend most, practically all of our time at Betaworks building stuff we want to build. And the other stuff um, is uh, sort of circumstance driven. Uh -huh. And so, it's it's not out like we're out there saying you know, um, are we going after this diminished brand? Um, I think that I think that I, uh, part of the challenge with Dig, which I loved, was just what you said is, is that people I'm, there aren't many people who've done that right and who've revitalized something. Yeah. And I was like, that's a really hard and interesting problem, and I wonder if we could do that. So we love we love hard problems. We love doing things that other people aren't do. We love doing things that people say. Are you crazy? Why would you do that? But um, um, but we're not sitting around saying you know whatever, however you call them. <laughs> You're not looking at the web and looking, yeah, yeah. calling Alexa graphs and thinking that's yeah, the one I'm gonna Alexa. snap up next. Alexa, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do with them? That's yeah, a lot well, of data. Yeah, well, they could have good data for a start. That's like such bad data. <laughs> it is just like, it's such, such bad data. Can I get a beer? Yeah, absolutely. Can someone get John a beer? Thank you. Um, um, what about, uh, where have you had the best track record? Investing, building, buying? Because it seems like investing, you had a lot of big hits early on that yeah, the, sort of proved the model so you had more freedom. 
Yeah, the, um, the, uh, the most successful stuff that we've done at Betaworks um, financially has been the stuff that we've played a role in building and developing. Mm -hmm. And so um, the investments, I mean, the pure investments, we did this, we did this analysis of, um, of just looking at the investments uh, because we'd done, I think, like 71 of them and we just said, let's just look at them as pure investments because the, the investing activity at Betaworks is, um, it is, it's so central to what we do at Betaworks, um, but it is, it, it sits around the core of what the studio built, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we looked at that as, as sort of in an isolated or sort of just as a pure mark to market and what we do, and we, you know, it, it's, uh, we're at about 5.6, uh, 5.7 X on that, which is, me, thank you, um, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're in the upper, you know, uh, sort of reaches of where a uh, seed fund would be if, that, if that's what you want to analyze this as. But we're not that, right? And I think the reason why was, we're really good at it is because we're not that. Uh -huh. Because we're fundamentally builders, we're makers, we have a different relationship to the entrepreneurs and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the, um, the biggest returns that we've had are being related to things that we've built. We've had a lot of conversations on this stage with you know, people from you know, Josh Koppelman, Ben Horowitz, Fred Wilson, all sorts of about where venture capital is going. Um, Naval from AngelList was a big one. And you know, a, a lot of people have had sort of bold visions on that. I mean, some people think it needs to be more service oriented. You know, Josh Koppelman's trying to build it into something that's more scalable and product based. You know, Fred Wilson thinks that discovering things is going to be separated um, from you know sort of the asset the asset management piece of it. Um, I'm curious. Do you think that you guys are emblematic of where venture capital goes, or do you think you are like just a weird outlier and no, that I it think goes that in another direction? Look, I think like uh, we I mean, we touched on this briefly earlier. Is I think that you've just got more diversity in the system, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we're a model which. Um, you're going to see more of, but you're going to see it alongside other people. And so it's just a, it's a different model, but it certainly can scale. You can build a big company this way, and, um, and you'll see other people do it, and you'll see other people continue to do what, um, you know, what we call venture capital today. I think that the, you know, the, that business, which I'm not a VC, so I don't pretend to know that much about, but I think that there's a lot of tension in that business. Um, and I, I think it comes from you know, a lot of from a lot of different angles. Um, one, of which is just one thing, which I've always thought is really weird and interesting about that business, is it is um, because of the life cycle of funds. Um, everybody keeps predicting. I mean, there has been an incredible culling of funds, mm -hmm. but ever since I've been in the business, people have been predicting that it's going away. Right. And it ain't, right? Mm -hmm. Or it hasn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing which I find fascinating about it is just what incredible uh, returns there is to the, uh, the very small number of people at top. Right. Right? And so it really is a, it's a pretty shitty asset class in, on the average, but it's a phenomenal asset class in a few cases. Um, and so that I think is, is, is interesting. I think the amount of time that capital's locked up in the funds is, um, is going to change. Uh -huh. I think that, you know, capital is, and investors are getting more sophisticated, you know, you're seeing, um, you're seeing investors sort of, normal investors in venture funds, you know, put together these special purpose vehicles and come into Pinterest, you know, when it's worth a couple of billion you know, independent of the, their VC investment. So you're seeing investors go direct. Uh -huh. You're seeing the Val and Angel list come up from the bottom, which I think is hugely disruptive and interesting. Um, and um, then you have all the crowdfunding stuff that's happening. So I think the whole market is, is, is shifting around, um, is shifting around this model. And I think it, it, it begs for innovation. Right. right, and so I mean, we don't sit there and say, "How can we innovate financially?" Because that's not the way we think. We're engineers, but not that kind of engineers, right? But it does beg for innovation, and we have taken a different model. The model we've taken is it, it is so intuitive to me, right? I mean, I remember I did this fireside chat with um, with Kevin Rose about two years ago on Foundation, and when he was running Milk, mm -hmm. 
right? And um, we talked about the investing side, and Kevin was like, I can see why you do so many things with the investing. You know, why do you do the investing? And I said, Kevin, you invest personally, yeah. right? And, and we talked about why he did that. And he does it, he certainly wants to make money, but he also does it because it gives him, um, there's the second order effects to the investment in terms of just understanding the market, keeping yourself alive to the innovation that's out there, understanding what's happening around the spaces that you're building. And you have entrepreneurs who are doing that personally. And we just do it at Betaworks. We just do it you know, off our balance sheet, mm -hmm. which is a little bit, it's architecturally different, right? But it is, it, um, when people hear it that way, they're like, okay, now I understand it, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I think that, I mean, the model to me is so intuitive. It just, it just makes sense, right? And my very first company, right, we sort of, I sort of, we hopscotch. You tried to like get a linear narrative, you know, from- You refused. Yeah. I gave up. Yeah. And so we just hopscotched around. But, you know, my first company, um, which uh, you know, was, you know, when I started Betaworks, my wife said to me, this is the same thing you did in 94. Yeah. Right? My first company was, we started with one site and then we built another site. I should talk about what they were because they were pretty great. But, and then we had an umbrella on top that was called Web Partners. Mm -hmm. And we raised capital into that. You know? And so this studio kind of model has, you know, sort of been in, uh, I don't know, it's, for me it's in my bones and it makes sense and it works for the way I think and the way I do things. Mm -hmm. um I want to talk a little bit about gaming um, because you guys were investors in OMG Pop, which was, you know, a big phenomenon and exit, and then sort of fell off the map. Um, you have Dots now, which apparently everyone except for me is spending their entire lives doing. I have a three-month-old, which is why I'm changing diapers instead of playing oh, Dots. Um, so, I thought we were, I thought we were going to play. There was somebody who tweeted. Yeah, I think you that guys was sort of gonna, the, yeah. the wish. But um, I you want to do it. I, no. <laughs> no. We can I, have someone from the audience play with yeah, you. No, 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 I am not, no, 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 I'm not, not playing against. I'm not I will be trounced in five yeah, seconds. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not playing against anybody from the audience. I'm not very good, <laughs> right? Well, then maybe I would be. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can give you some tips if you'd like. There are people with love tips. Yeah, so this is what I've heard, not necessarily what I've experienced because I'm... Um, so you cannot vouch for these tips? No, look, I mean, I love doing things which I've, and speaking from experience, but I mean, I'm in the, I don't know, um, I've got it on a lot of different phones in a lot of different, but I think I'm in the high 200, so I'm certainly not a dots sort of expert. I think mm -hmm. I'm like a, I don't know, a yellow belt or something like that. <laughs> I don't even know a judo belt. I'm like, I'm way down there. <laughs> um, so, um, um, squares, right? You got to do squares, and it, and it's um, and people. I think sometimes people take a while figuring out, um, and they, they want to. There's something very human about like wanting to like you get a big rectangle and like filling out. Just do the square, right? Because you get the same points and it's much faster. So just think squares, 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 squares. Um, second thing is is the um, don't be shy about restarting. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I think that people sort of have this sort of like, well, I started, I should just go through the whole game. Just like restart and just like re redo the game. Because you get a board that is working in your favor. It's kind of like one of those days in life that just sort of everything I'm, say, I'm fits. like seeing an analogy of building web companies here yes. as well. Yeah, no, this is, it's, <laughs> dots is a metaphor for Betaworks, right? It is, it's all about kinetic, c connecting the dots, right? And so, um, you get a board just like you get a day where just everything seems to work, right? And you're just like, so don't, don't feel shy about restarting. Um, the power-ups um, are, uh, are really useful, right? And so um, shrinkers people love, um, which are the things in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the reasons why the shrinkers are so effective is that you can, you can use them in, in, the, game, in the game flow Mm -hmm. Right, you don't have to leave the game, go to the bottom, you can just right. double tap, right? So you see something that's almost a square, you double tap and you zap the other thing and then you go square. Um, and then extra time, right? The, the, uh, the bottom left, um, uh, if you've got a good board, 
and a good game going in, you're 50, you know, you've got 10 seconds left, just hit that left hand button and you've got some extra time. Mm -hmm. So those are some dots, there you go, Sarah. <laughs> what well, was your question? The <laughs> phenomenon of dots. Well, I wanna talk about, um, the, there's so much um, skepticism and sort of bearishness about gaming right now. And I think a lot of it comes from Zynga, which you know, certainly tied in OMG Pop, um, right now you're seeing people are really excited about Candy Crush, but they wonder, is this going to be a downside for, downsize for King? There's people who feel like Angry Birds, like maybe that's waning. Um, and there's just a lot of sense of, you know, game companies are too hits driven and you, you cannot build a venture backable, exitable business around games. I mean, having now profited from a few of these things which were very hits driven, I'm curious how you think about games and if they're different than other types of things you guys build. Well, I mean, I think that the, the um, so I'm not a gaming guy, right? And we, I mean, I think that the, the reason why we did dots is um, partially is because we aren't gaming people. It, mm -hmm. was, it was different for us. But um, um, I think I think the gaming business um, and games, um, similar to music, um, have always been subject to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you were a kid or when your kid grows up, there's going to be ten games um, that he or she will play, and that you know. Um, so there's, it's it's always been that way with games, and so I think that. You know, if you're asking the question, should gaming companies be venture funded? Should they be public companies? I think that you're coming at it from a sort of capital perspective, uh -huh. right? And um, and I, I would come at it from a, look, I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago, I met the CEO of Supercell, mm -hmm. right? They're making about a million bucks a day. Um, they've raised some venture money, but you know, they've got sort of a studio-like structure um, there was this company this week in Boulder who sold to Hasbro, who sold 70% of their company to Hasbro, that is another gaming studio. So there's a bunch of, there's the gaming studio and the studio structure intrigues me because it's you know, not dissimilar to what we think about at Betaworks. But I think that the, um, the fact that gaming's hit driven is, it is a hit driven business. Mm -hmm. Now, so a couple of answers to you know, the capital question that I can think of off the bat. Um, is one is is that there's you know there's a very good answer which is um, most music companies ended up in larger media companies uh, because you can balance the hit driven aspect of it with other assets. Right. Right. So maybe the gaming companies should either not be public companies or they should be mixed in with another set of assets. Right. Mm -hmm. In the same way is is that you have like um, uh, you have a lot of gaming going on down here in Wall Street. Right, mm -hmm. and most investment banks have mixed that with advisory businesses, mm -hmm. which are sort of more predictable, and um, you know sort of have less less um, sort of velocity you know to them, and so you know I think the idea of um, mixing a gaming business with another business um, may be the solution if you're going to be a public company. But it is a hit driven business, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody would deny that, right? I mean, and do you feel like you're riding, you guys are riding this wave of dots, but like pretty soon no one's going to care? I mean, does well, this, I does would, that feel inevitable? I, I, would say, I would say a couple of, so, so there are games, I mean, there are, there are iconic games that have persisted, right? And so, um, uh, you know, if we can, if we can, the bar, the high bar for us is can we turn dots into something that becomes an iconic game? Mm -hmm. Right, and so we're getting about 12 million game plays a day now, which um, ain't bad. And uh, you know we are developing it and developing new forms of the gaming and so on. And so if we can turn it into that, then that would be great. Um, but um, you, you, the question's totally fair. There's some which just you know fly really high, and then crash and burn. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know. Was that Farm Bill? I'm not sure. I mean, it's like, you know, and could they have done something different there with Farm Bill? Mm -hmm. um, or if Draw Something hadn't been sold to Zynga, would the outcome have been different? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, both PayPal getting sold and how that limited what PayPal could have become. Uh, possibly Draw Something getting sold, limiting what it could have become, or they could have become as a game studio. What do you think about Tumblr? A company you were involved in early days, 
many people have said failed to actually really build a business and, um, you know, I, I, I guess monetize sort of all of the promise and what was great about Tumblr. Do you see that as a failure and do you worry that somehow by selling to Yahoo it's limiting what it could have become? Look, I think that, I mean, I think that Yahoo is suddenly a hugely interesting company again because uh, Marissa is a product person, right? And she's not a manager, she's not a, um, she's not in the business of, um, of um, sort of constructing leadership. She actually has, she has a product vision, right? And she was willing to go out and, um, and do a, an acquisition like Tumblr. Um, I think that, um, I think Tumblr was starting to monetize. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I think if they had stayed independent, I think you would have seen numbers come out of Tumblr would have been impressive because I think that you know, Tumblr does have, there's a lot of page views there. And go back to what we talked about with Twitter before and the sort of the pixel problem, right? Yeah. So, so whereas Twitter sort of, you know, when they decided to do advertising, they needed to find that inventory and find all those pixels. And they had a very fast moving stream and they had a lot of clients. Uh, they had a fast moving stream and a distributed um, set of endpoints, right? Tumblr and David architected beautifully this platform where there was no clients and he had a lot of pixels. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, you know, he was starting to monetize and could have monetized. So I don't see it as a failure of, of that. I think that, um, I think that the, the company was, um, you know, was struggling to sort of mature and build out the management team and you know, get to the next stage. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen many companies who've gone through that. I, I have high hopes inside of Yahoo. I mean, I hope that it will be like a YouTube-like thing, right? Um, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist, and I, I M and A is really hard, mm -hmm. um, and most of it gets fucked up, right? And in most cases, you know, it becomes sort of something that gets sidelined. Um, mm -hmm. I think Google did a phenomenal job with YouTube. Was that by architecture? Was that by happenstance that they didn't really get it and they just left it alone? Because they were just like, uh, whatever that YouTube thing. Right. I don't know. But it, it worked there and I hope we can do more of those. I mean, I think one of the things that's fascinating today and it sort of goes back to the Betaworks question. Was, so you have, so what's Twitter doing with Vine? Right, okay, so at some sort of, you're, you're in the journalist business and you're sort of like in the business of trying to connect these dots. So at some level, they're trying to like get video-like experiences into Twitter, mm -hmm. right? And you could say, oh, they're trying to do, you know, they didn't get Instagram, um, they didn't get Instapaper, and so now they want to get a video experience in Twitter. Right. Um, and so, okay, that makes sense to me, but it's a different brand. Yeah. It's an entirely different thing. So is Twitter now becoming a collection of products? You know, does Facebook, you know, how do these companies grow up? How does innovation, you know, that, so that question we started with at the beginning, how does innovation actually get sustained within these companies? Right. And then how do, does Twitter become a platform where they have a monetization platform and they share that across Vine and then they buy four other things and share them across there? Mm -hmm. And they become, you know, they have much broader reach because of that. It's, you know, something interesting is going on there. Well, so what about Yahoo, that, though? Because that's... What about what? I mean, Yahoo's an even more extreme example of yeah, this. Yeah. Like, some people look at Betaworks, and they just see a bunch of stuff, and it doesn't make sense to them as a cohesive thing. That's how I feel about Yahoo and the acquisitions yeah. that Marissa's making. Well, I mean, I think that... Um, the... So you, you need to have... I think that as a product person, I mean, I think about things... Again, the habitual stuff people use every day. And the core of Yahoo at the beginning was the directory. Mm -hmm. And then it became email. Mm -hmm. And if I'd been running Yahoo, I would have threaded more stuff around the directory and email. And I think that, you know, I mean, they did phenomenal acquisitions. You know, Flickr was an amazing company. Yeah. Delicious was an amazing company. I mean, but then they kind of like, they, the organization kind of rejected them, or the organism kind of rejected them, and they got kind of like staff resources and kind of like, well, there was Yahoo Photos still, right? Right. And they, I mean, it's like they should have, 
page flick at Yahoo Photos. Mm -hmm. And they should have you know, figured out how to be a multi-brand company, but also threaded into that core experience, which was where most of the traffic was in email, in Yahoo Finance, and those core things. So I think that she's trying to re-architect that. Um, I, I don't envy her. I mean, it's, it's, it is very hard, I think, to re-architect that from the top down. Mm -hmm. It's much uh, easier and much more fun to architect it like we're doing at Betaworks from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, you know, because we can make things, we can make things that they connect and we can put them together and make them make sense and um, we can grow them up um, and we can kill things and we can, you know, just keep, you know, moving very fast through this process. Whereas if you're sitting there at Yahoo, you've got sort of like, you know, you've got all this legacy business, you've got all these legacy business models, you've got um, a lot of legacy code, and you've got a lot of legacy culture mm -hmm. that says you can't do that with email, you can't kill Yahoo Photos, Yahoo Photos is so important to somebody, right? Right. And you just, you know, but I think as a product person, I think that she has the best chance of making the hard calls. Because mm -hmm. you've got to like, you've got to make sense of that as a product. Right. And it's either a portfolio that has some connective tissue in it, um, or it is a, um, or they should just spin them out and shut them down, mm -hmm. which is kind of the approach that AOL's taken, right? Yeah. So, last thing I want to ask you about, and then I want to get some questions from last the audience, thing, right. um, is you know let's talk about New York a little bit. Um, and now I've had like endless conversations, both you know on stage at uh, at TechCrunch and you know doing these at, about you know where New York is as an ecosystem and how does it compare and blah 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 blah. I'm interested in hearing from you because you think about things differently. What do you think people don't understand about the New York ecosystem? What's either overstated or what's understated? But what has made this finally? catch fire in a way that a lot of ecosystems in the U.S. want to, but very few do. Okay. What is, um, what is not understated? I, I mean, I think that um, no, 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 no. So, I, I, look, I think the New York eco ecosystem is finally emerging. I think that there's a lot more technology here and love for technology than people actually understand and appreciate. Mm -hmm. Because the scale of media, the scale of finance, all that stuff is so huge in the city that it overshadows what we do. But it also brings, um, it brings diversity to what we do. I mean, I, I, um, I, I came over here with somebody who's, um, who's with us for a bit of Betaworks. And, uh, who moved in from California, and I asked him why did he come from California, mm -hmm. and he said because I I work down in California. Everywhere I go, um, when I go out to dinner, when I go out to lunch, people are talking about Python, people are talking about their startup, people are talking. And then in New York, I get to go out and I get to sort of see and feel and experience the world, right, mm -hmm. and a sense of the world, right. That feeds me. It feeds my brain. I mean, I I've had you know this discussion with many people out west and. To talk to, I remember talking, arguing with Reed Hoffman about it. It's like, it, it is, um, it's hugely stimulating to me. I would be stifled in Mountain View. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's such an incredibly beautiful part of the world that is like being turned into like these office parks that are just like, it's like barren. It's like <laughs> so, like, it's so sad. Um, and it's so devoid of culture. It's like, and, and I think that the web is so much of what we're building today and what I believe we're building towards is, you know, about the humanization of technology and about taking this, I mean, we've never before in the history of mankind, womankind, people kind, dog kind, anything, we've never before um, had a, such a short period of history of time where we're re-architecting the way we think and the way that we interact with our environment, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody came by Betaworks yesterday, and they said, oh my god, it's so silent. And everybody's sitting there at Betaworks building stuff, and they're looking at their screens, and their heads are like, you know, their brains are like immersed in this thing, and they've got this crude input device called, you know, a keyboard and a mouse. But their brains are like totally like inside of this world. Mm -hmm. and that's happened in 30 years, yeah. right? Like we've, I mean, we've taken like human, 
creativity and like placed it inside of a network. It's like, it's astounding what we're doing. And there is yet so much of the world that we've built, the physical world that we've built in cities like in New York. And so much of what we built around us, businesses, fashion industry, design industry, tech industry, and so on, finance, uh, the representations of humankind and of human interest. Mm -hmm. And those, are, those need to be part of that humanization of technology needs to be part of how we build what we're building. Mm -hmm. Because we can't like, create this, this world for our children that is one where we've like, dumbed down the diversity of our human experiences down to a set of categories that happen to be good for a discrete monetization you know, tool on a particular website, mm -hmm. right? Not to pick on Facebook, but. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the world is so much more diverse than that, and, and humankind is that. And, and we have to, you know, I think that cities like New York are doing a phenomenal job of that, of bringing that diversity into technology. And they're just different from Silicon Valley, right? It's like, I love Silicon Valley. Every time I go there, I get so excited about the stuff I see, the people I meet, and the quality of, people there and the, the thinking. But I also, when I get on the plane, come back, I'm like, phew, I'm, I, you know, it's like I digest all of that, but the food for my brain is, is in the diversity of the culture here. Mm -hmm. Does that answer some of your question? Yeah. Let me give you yeah. a very different answer, which is okay. one which you probably won't expect, is uh, I think that Bloomberg has done an insanely great job. Mm -hmm. So, um, and for New York. Um, and for New York Tech. So, you know, um, you know just to state biases up front, I've had, uh, uh, I'm, there's a technology council that I'm part of uh, uh, for the mayor. So I've, um, so I've seen some of it up close, but they, they have, they've done a really good job of being at times like, um, at staying at the right layer of the stack. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, I'm. A, uh, yeah, I, I think it's hugely important that government understand which layer of the stack that they can have an influence at and then mm -hmm. stay the hell out of the other layers, uh -huh. right? And they've done a great job, I mean, at, at certain layers of the stack. Mm -hmm. And they've also done a great job of like f figuring out what are these sort of the small things that you can do architecturally because, you know, it's sort of, it, I mean, it goes back to Betaworks in some sense is, is that all of this is about like how you architect what you do. Mm -hmm. What's the intent that you bring to what you build? And how do you, how do you set up the house? How do you architect the framework, mm -hmm. right? And I think that Bloomberg and the Bloomberg administration have had a point of view that um, you know, they've been, it's been fairly distributed. They've accepted input from a lot of different places. They've focused on critical layers of the stack that they can influence. They've stayed out of other layers. They've um, done some insanely great data projects, um, mm -hmm. which I think have helped the city in, in wonderful ways. And, um, and I think that they brought more transparency and accountability to the process of city government, yeah. which, has been, you know, which has been great. Um, yeah. So I think we've been, you know, we've been lucky. Yeah, I've, I've written a lot about how I think the city of San Francisco and Silicon Valley are really always fighting with each other because they're just very, very different ethoses in terms of um, success and wealth and capitalism and protectionism and, and all of these issues. And I was struck on Monday, I came in town Sunday night and I turned on sort of CNBC on, on, my, on my hotel Monday and they had someone on there talking about how, you know, New York is turning all of these abandoned phone booths into hotspots. And I just thought, I just said, this is just a better city. It is just a better city. Yeah. You just cannot argue it. Right. And I think it's the diversity. It's the diversity of, look, I mean, one of the things, the Bloomberg guys are very analytical and they looked at finance and they said, okay, that's a mature industry. It's a big frigging industry. Um, let's look at what else there is, right? Mm -hmm. There's technology and there's fashion, right? Mm -hmm. And I know both those industries, my sister-in-law, my brother on the fashion side, so I know that sort of, and they've, they've sort of fed both of those, right, mm -hmm. aggressively. And it's just, you know, I think that they've done a phenomenal job of that. I think the diversity of that is helpful because San Francisco is at some level a company town. Yeah. 
And I think that that concentration actually works against it in some ways, right? I think, I think people also feel like tech is out of control and needs to be something that's reined in right. versus encouraged. Right. Um, all right, well, let's go to some questions from the audience because I think there's a million things we could talk about with you. You have such a broad portfolio. I'd like to hear what's on other people's mind. And just line up alongside this wall if you have questions. Don't be shy. Hi, John. How are you? Don't um, listen thanks to for, uh, Thanks for spending so much time with us. Um, you recently judged the New York City Big Apps, Big Apps competition. Yeah. So can you just talk about that, kind of just picking up off of those last comments you made about diversity in New York and what Mayor Bloomberg's doing, and what excited you about it, and um, what do you think that can do sure. to help? So I was, um, uh, I, I, um, I've been part of the Big Apps um, competition from the beginning. I've been a judge from the beginning, and we, um, um, we, we worked with, um, you know, Challenge Post powered it at the beginning and then Collab found uh, powered it this time, which are both Betaworks companies. So we're sort of tightly embedded in here. That's my sort of disclosures up front. <laughs> but, but this year was great. And I think that um, I th the apps that came out were great. Look, last year was like, there was like 30% of the apps were, I hope you didn't build one of these. About 30% of the apps were like, you know, rest, they took the data stream for like, um, are the rats at this restaurant? And, you know, it was basically the sanitation department on restaurants, and it was just like a different app to like, find me the restaurant that has the best sanitation record. And that's, you know, nice, but you don't need 30 of them. And uh, this year was much more creative. And I think it's a, I think it's, I, I mean, look, it, it goes back to that architecture point that I was making before, is that we did a meeting with the um, Bloomberg uh, and his team a couple of weeks ago, and they really understood, look, well, let me say something up front somewhat. I think that when they first came into tech, I mean, they are, Bloomberg is a technologist, tech entrepreneur, but he's not really from the internet, right? And when they first came in, it was, it was, I think it coincided with the real action, and it was somewhat marketing, uh -huh. right? I mean, we've seen politicians come in time and time again and use the internet uh, for fundraising slash marketing purposes, and then, you know, once they get elected, they're like, okay, that was useful. Now let me get back to sort of politics as usual. I think the administration, um, the Bloomberg administration, either understood or they had hunch that the big apps competition and opening up APIs would increase the availability of data within the city and the accessibility of data within the city. So one of the things that we pushed for, you know, which finally started to happen, was to have read-write APIs. Because at the beginning, the first big apps, it was like, I forgot, but it was like you got a CSV dump, right? You didn't, I mean, there was, it was just basically a big data dump. There wasn't like a continual stream of data. Um, but to have read-write APIs really got you to the point that you could start building interesting things. The, I think what's great is that you're starting to see the city is using these APIs internally, right? Which is insanely great, right? There's this wonderful story, I'll go through this quickly, but um, that the city did, you know, they have this internal thing called DataBridge, which uses the APIs across the 36 or 38 agencies within New York City. And they um, focused the DataBridge project on like figuring out fires. And they figured out that the, um, the single greatest predictor of a fire in a building was age of the building and materials of the building, right? Building materials, fairly obvious, right? Um, but then they looked at fire inspections and they realized that the, one of the single uh, best indicators of whether a building was inspected was, was the, a Costco near the building, uh, which the fire guys could go shopping, or was there a Dunkin' Donuts nearby? Um, and seriously, I mean, it's like the fire houses are responsible for inspections. Supposedly, they hate inspections. It was all done on car catalog, and inspections were like entirely uncorrelated to places of high incidence. So they used the data to remap that. And fires are way down in New York. I mean, it's like 
it's, it's awesome, right? But it's so obvious, but it's like, so I think that the, again, going to architecture, right? Because if you change the architecture of a system, then you begin to change all the follow on effects. So I think big apps is much bigger than the apps. It's like beginning to API, it's beginning to like construct an API for a city. That's interesting. And the data for a city, which I think is hugely exciting. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. I got to rant a bit. Oh. I'm so jealous of talking to you as a city. One, two? Yeah. Oh. You should move it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in the last year, you guys have done some interesting stuff with uh, location, like uh, Paperboy acquiring Vibe and investing in Highlight. Where do you see kind of location as you know, fitting in, into your ecosystem as a layer um, across your existing infrastructure? And, and where do you see kind of the current analogies, uh, analogs being, being made uh, and drawn between location uh, in the real world and location Based services. So, um, so great question. I'm 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 fascinated by location. And Sarah, you know, uh, failed in like getting the narrative from the beginning. But you know, the <laughs> second company I started was called Total New York, and it was the uh, one of the first city sites, right? And so we're talking 1995, um, 94, October 94. Um, and so I've been fascinated by location because. You know, at a very general or sort of an abstract level, when you think about the architecture of the web and you think about like trying to like understand the web, is like location and mapping are how we understand our world, right? And they're the sort of the the um, the construct, the data construct. The map is a data construct we place around our world, right? And so I'm fascinated by that, and I think that ambient um, location collection. Um, services like Highlight are fascinating, right? And I think we are just, I mean, if you ever met Paul Davidson, he is, he's a great founder entrepreneur. He's thought about this stuff intensely. Um, we are just at the beginning of this, right? And so, um, you know, as data collection becomes more distributed, as it becomes ambient data collection becomes more widely available through, you know, whether it's Google Glass or wristbands or so services like Moves or stuff like that. There's like Moves API is really cool, right? Jake over at Betaworks has done some cool hacking on that. It's like there's like so much stuff which is going to come out of this. Um, you know, um, there's like retailers who are starting to, I mean, there's serious privacy issues here, but they're starting to look at, um, um, you know, most people have their Wi Fi turned on on their phone. Right, so I can see uh, your, your Mac address, and I, I don't know who you are, but I know that you came to my store yesterday and that you went back to the underwear department four times, right? And so, not saying that you did, but it's getting late, so. Um, it's a coincidence, yeah. though, he did, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, all that data is becoming available. And so, you could see, I mean, we're creating this massive data shadow, right, in real space. That I think that you know, understanding that and understanding it historically, understanding how that you know relates to other services, hugely interesting. Okay. Paperboy rocks. <laughs> what is she telling? Me? I don't know. Yes. Be brief. <laughs> what are you saying? She wants me not to yell into the mic at you. Oh. Okay. oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, John. don't listen to her. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my name's Andrew. I'm a student at NYU. Uh, in your most recent shareholders letter from from BetaWorks, you talked a lot about contextual web. You know, bringing. You read. You read that thing. I read that thing. <laughs> I read all Good twenty-five. Good for you. Pages I try. It. I can't was, get past page one. It was one. awesome. It was so. It was Look, I um. It's, that is an opportunity for me to like, it's a, f it's a free flow of ideas. So thank you for reading it, but um, yeah, my sympathies. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting, the, the idea of contextual web and bringing services yeah. that we look at every day yeah. to filtering things from urgent messages, which you, you, know, you, you talked about a little bit, all the way to just daily routine. Um, do, you know, do you have any hints on maybe how that will manifest? Um, where do you see that developing? Yeah, so, I mean, interestingly, it relates to the previous question, right? I mean, it's this massive data shadow, and it's all contextual data. I, I refer to it as contextual computing. I think it's really important the term you use for this stuff, right? And because I think language sort of 
dictates how you frame things and mm -hmm. how you think about them. So I don't, Internet of Things to me is very passive. Contextual is like this uh, dynamic rich environment. And as I said earlier, is I think that as data moves and it gains context, it gains, it gains, uh, it gains value in a lot of cases, right? And so, um, so I think that there's, you know, we're gonna see an incredible amount of technology and of software um, that is gonna be built around that. And we're fascinated by that. Um, it is, um, it is, it's, it's happening. Um, it's happening in an incredibly distributed way. So I believe the, you know, I've often argued for the, the, the physics are on the side of openness. Um, forget the politics, but I think the physics draw one's, us towards openness. And the physics for me are that, you know, she is not banned. Do you not have on your wrist? Sure. Yes, yes. I do. And, you know, I have, um, let's say, a Nike Fuel band, and, um, and um, you know, somebody else uses the Moves app. Um, people want that data to interconnect, right? right? And, um, and the Jawbone guys are unlikely to, or the Oakley guys are unlikely to build an end-to-end -end operating system like Google will. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're gonna interoperate the Oakley glasses well, which you know, will come because Google Glass is wonderful, sort of, it's kind of wonderfully interesting, but it, it's, the tech is not that hard, right? But what they will, the Oakley glasses will be interoperable with everything, right? It won't just be Google Plus on there, it will be everything on there, right? So I think the distributed nature of the environment we're building, the, the data collection environment, is the physics on the side of openness. And that to me is very exciting, why? Because, I mean, put my politics on the table, I like that. Um, because I, but it also increases diversity. I like it because it increases diversity and it increases our ability to actually create this again in a human way, right? To create these experiences and architect these experiences in a human way. Mm -hmm. So, does that answer? Yeah, that's really cool. interesting. Hey John, thanks for saving Dig. I'm a daily user, appreciate that. Would you well, recommend it to a friend? I would now. My sister actually recommended it back to me. I migrated away. There you go. <laughs> I'm back. And I think we, you didn't say it, but I think we resurveyed. And is anybody here from Dick? Uh, I think we resurveyed, and I think 80% said they would now recommend. It's very good. It cost exactly. me a lot of time. I have to try not to look at it. Like, all links are so good. Yeah, it's great. Look, there's great content on the internet. I think we're doing a really good job with Dick, and it's, I'm excited about that. It's great for you. Um, so my question was, you mentioned when you were in business school, uh, how you went up to MIT and you saw the internet, and you, you were like ready to leave. You were worried you were going to miss it, that it was going to happen. Um, I kind of felt that way about mobile, and I was wondering like, if you think there's a similar thing. Has technology sped up, or is mobile still happening, and we're like in the midst of it, or is it going to take a longer time? Mobile's still happening. It's just starting. It's just like, you know, we put mobile through this very, very tight, like, you know, sort of prism of, uh, you know, a desktop and a set of apps, and it's like as it gets distributed out to all these other devices, it's still happening, right? The logical place, um, it is that thing is a you know it is a receptor for for data and for a Wi-Fi connection, and occasionally you want an immersive experience in it. But right now he wants to look at me, not immerse himself. He's trying to type at the same time, and <laughs> that's you know that will that will help him when he's got something which he can actually take notes to, right? And so. Um, is that, you know, is that a watch? Is it glass? Is it an embed? I mean, we are bringing computing into the human experience. We're bringing computing into our bodies, right? It's happening. We're architecting this. This is like, it is, you know, the, um, we see sci-fi things like Terminator and we say, um, how bizarre and how weird, but we're actually, we're doing that. Singularities, I think, or? Well, I mean, I think singularity, I mean, that's a whole nother, you know, you th throw Kurzweil in there and you get into those assumptions about like the, I, I think that you have, it's undeniable the scale of processors, it's undeniable the, the curves associated with hard drives and with storage. I think that the, the scale curves associated with software development are not quite moving at the same pace. And so I don't see the, um, I don't think the thing becoming sentient anytime soon. But I think the network is itself becoming a thing. And it's a thing that we're creating as a reflection of ourselves. 
and we're putting so much of our love mm -hmm. and life in it, mm -hmm. and our kids and our dogs and, and our, our sense of identity and our identity and, and yeah. our words, our words, yeah. right? Of you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of like precious like words, right? We're putting all of those into this network thing, right? These things used to be very very precious. And, and our ideas, and our pictures, and our, you know. And so, we are, in a sense, creating that. And I think we need to be, we need to be conscious of that, because we need to be conscious of the fact that we're building that. And we're the architects, right? And that sounds like a big lofty statement, it's not. It's just, we're all trying to build our little piece of it. Mm -hmm. And, but we've got to be conscious of the whole, because there is a whole that's being built. Okay, great. Am I rambling? No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, Don, are you out there? No. <laughs> there was somebody I was going to have dinner with, but he's not here, so. <laughs> so we've gone long. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Don, Let's keep going. wherever yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> we've got two up. more questions. Yeah. We're, we're in the home stretch, John. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great interview, by the way. Thanks, Sarah and Thank John. Um, I, w I have a question about thoughts. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the retention? Like, what is the biggest retention factor for long-term users of DOTS? What does the retention numbers look like? So the retention numbers actually look pretty strong. Um, you know, we, we look at second-day retention, we look at 30-day retention, and um, I'm not going to tell you what they are, because I tell you, the gaming companies, these are like, they're like machines about these metrics. Um, they are up there in the sort of, you know, the top quartile, it's, they're strong. Um, and so we're happy with them. Um, can we make them better? Yeah. But, um, well, long term users, so it's been, I, I, I think it's been seven weeks. Um, or something like that, so long-term user. I mean, I, I did this thing on CNBC, and this uh, lady said to me, this lovely lady was interviewing me, she said, you know, um, we, um, my, my son's school, they, you know, they, they're using, they've adopted DOTS now um, uh, for kids who have um, you know, some fine motor issues, right? So it was like good for their fingers, particularly boys often have like middle school fine motor issues and that the schools approved it as a, as a tool. And I was like, the thing's been out there for four weeks and it's been approved by your school. <laughs> and so it's, it's very early days. It's very early days. Look, um, people seem to, they love the game. Um, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, Patrick created a beautiful game. Um, yeah, I think it is a, um, it's, a, uh, it's something which hopefully doesn't demand too much of you. You know, um, what, we want is, what we strive for is something which you'll love, but which you won't get burnt out because you feel like it's something you need to do all the time, mm -hmm. like, you, like a candy high. Um, uh, and so what we want is we want sort of more, um, we want it to be more sustainable food sort. And, um, you know, not, not a Twinkie. Okay, great. Last question. Uh, this is Jeff Bonner from Jumpstart Wireless. Hi. And hi. And I was uh, really engaged with your discussion of architectures and sort of layers and pieces using other pieces and building a, an ecosystem of parts. And I hope I haven't bastardized it too much in that summary. but. And that used to be a discussion heavily, that was all an enterprise discussion, enterprise IT discussion. And you're really talking about it in the consumer space. Yep. And, and I work mostly in the enterprise space. Yep. And so I'm, uh, I'd be very interested in your thoughts about the enterprise and sort of how does that thinking play back into the enterprise and what's the future of enterprise IT and What's your, are wow. you doing anything in that area? That's a big one. I mean, I think that the consumers, you know, uh, 
it's like it's when it's late it's easy to spout one line it's the consumerization of IT and of enterprises <laughs> happening it's I mean it's it is what's what's happening I mean I think you have you know a few vectors that influence this you had massive move to the cloud right which meant all of this platform all the stuff was cheaper more available and available anywhere you had 2008 and you had a financial meltdown with a lot of pullback and so I think a lot of corporations figured they could outsource their IT to their employees, right? So instead of giving this nice person a BlackBerry, they would say to him, why don't you go get an iPhone? That's a great idea. And so you, you'll buy it and you'll support it and you won't have to call IT and you know, that's great. And we'll retire all those BlackBerrys and then we'll get rid of the whole IT support department. And so I think that a lot of reasons why this happened but it is fundamentally changing the way enterprises work. I think also, I mean, the advent of social is fun, it is upending, you know, what we think of as a customer, right? And what, you know, the line between customer, company, and product development, right? I mean, I think it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's insanely great that we have, you know, we have brands like GE and Dove who've come to like Dig and Tapestry and Giphy you know, to work with them, to the small companies, right? So we have big brands who want to come work and figure out how they can tell stories, right? Because at some level, that's what brands do, but also integrate their products into this layer of innovation. And I think that we have, you know, the, the social revolution is, you know, breaking down the walls of, you know, of, of the enterprise and is, transforming the way that you know, enterprises work with their customers, their suppliers, and you know, it's, the, it's the unbundling of the enterprise. Right? I mean, one of the great, you know, fascinating processes that goes on with the internet is the package gets unbundled, right? So, you know, first, you know, the newspaper package got unbundled, Craigslist over here, and content here. Now we're seeing, you know, the enterprise become unbundled, and transaction costs become more efficient as it becomes unbundled. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing, you know, education becoming unbundled, right? Mm -hmm. We're seeing all these categories across society. This is what I was talking about, just like how we're re-architecting our, our world, is that we're unbundling all these things. The, and I think it's, um, yeah. I haven't heard it described that way. That's interesting, unbundling. Um, I mean, because it is, it's like, in some senses, venture capital we we're talking about, about different parts, you know, doing different aspects. Yeah. Um, all right, we're in the home Are we stretch. Done? Almost. Set I have, me free. I have yes. two, uh, no, no. you're almost You said last free. question. I, well, of them, you, you I have the two final question. questions. Oh, okay. If you ever watched Japan a Monthly, you'd know these things. Yes, okay. Um, but before we get to those, I want to thank our sponsors, um, Trinet and Venmo. Um, please either support them download them or just tweet something nice or get your $10 from Venmo. Um, and then tonight will have really been a bargain. And um, making that even more valuable, there's apparently like a shitload of cupcakes in the back of the room. So take cupcakes with you, take them to a loved one, give them to Venmo, do, do lots of things with them. There are cupcakes in the back. Don't forget your cupcakes by all means. Um, all right, last two questions. What is the one thing you believe that few other people believe? Um, these, stand, these sound like, like standard questions that you ask each time, yeah? Yes. Oh, thank you. Again, so you that's why watched. I should have watched the damn thing. <laughs> um, what is one, something that I believe that few other people believe? Um, you know, I mean, I have I've, I've infinite um, confidence in, in humanity and in our ability to, you know, create and recreate this world. Um, I hope a lot of other people believe that. Um, uh -huh. Sometimes when I read, you know, watch the news and look at the media, I scratch my head and say maybe not. But I think that, um, you know, we're living in an uh, unbelievable era of access and of, and of creativity. Mm -hmm. What do I believe that, let me think of something more rarefied. Um, I think the line between computing and between the, the, the interface and between data and between human thought is a lot grayer than we, uh, than we acknowledge mm -hmm. um, normally. I think we think of this as something else and it's, 
it, it's not, it's us, and it's part of what we have created. And so, and I think it's, that's, to me, that's hugely important to believe because it makes us accountable mm -hmm. for what we've created and the, and the follow-on effects of it because I think technology has a grain to it. Um, I think it has directionality to it. And I think that uh, there are unintended consequences to things we build. And we need to, as builders, we need to um, own those responsibilities and live to them and you know, see if we can make a better world through them. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. All right, I'm, I think I anticipate you'll have a good answer to this one. If you could have one mediocre superpower, what would it be? Would you like some examples of mediocre, mediocre superpowers? Could, like Russia? So, like Russia? <laughs> yes, you would take Russia. <laughs> like a mediocre. No, like a, a supernatural power that has natural oh. limits on it. <laughs> oh, it's no one has ever said Russia before. I will give you originality points. <laughs> what? Um, God. Um, would you like some examples? No. Okay. I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd like to one the media. Brazil, <laughs> Japan. Yeah, Brazil's not media. Well, <laughs> Russia's probably not either. Um, but yeah, but in the scheme of things. Um, okay. Um, back to so, as, what is a mediocre super? I mean, I would like. I mean, I. So I'll tell you the thing which first came to mind, which. Um, uh, the f thing that first came to mind was the back button um, and the forward button. <laughs> I think that the um, you know the back button is like an incredibly powerful thing that was created and architected into the browser. Uh -huh. It'd be kind of fun to have one for life. Uh -huh. um, but I don't really want that um, because <laughs> I I think that the idea of being able to go back and like edit is um, is just uninteresting. It'd be fun once and then it would be like life would just be uninteresting with that. That's similar to Dennis Crowley's. He said being able to like TiVo back in life by five seconds. Yeah, but so a short back button would be interesting, but I think it'd be interesting for five seconds and then you'd say that is a curse. That's the kind of technology that if you invented, I think you'd have to live with the consequences for a long time because <laughs> I just think that, um, I think it would make life less interesting. Um, what would be, um, a five second forward button would be interesting. Um, let me think of some other things. Um, flight, does that count? Well, you'd have to put limitations around it. You have to put limitations. Like a short can, flight, right? Like I mean, it's you like, can fly the, for five minutes or. No, I would just like to, I would like to fly over the TSA, right? <laughs> just like <laughs> if I could like skip that part of like check in, that would be good. So that's short flight. That's no? sort of meta to fly to then get on a plane. Yeah, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but you said there's a limitation. Right, to it. right, okay. right. Um, it's late. Um, what other things um, can I think of? Um, yeah, nothing else comes to mind. We right can, we'll accept flying. Russia. Over TSA. I'll accept Russia. Russia. <laughs> <laughs> you will be the only person to ever yeah. say Russia. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for doing this. It was oh, great okay. getting to know you yeah. more.